Judges of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having business before this, a stated term of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Draw near, give your attention, and you shall be heard. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Judge Lee, and I'm here with uh, Judge Jacobs and Judge Lynch, and we are ready to hear five cases on the uh, argument calendar for today. I'm told that all attorneys are present, so we'll go ahead and get started with the first case on the calendar. Uh, Brett Christian Firearms Policy et al. B. Stephen A. Negrelli. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Esther Murdukaeva for the state defendant. This court will hear several cases this morning involving prohibitions on the carriage of firearms in certain locations. This is not one of them. New York's private property default rule does not bar carrying firearms in any location. It merely requires that a person obtain express consent from the proprietor before entering someone else's private property with a firearm. Uh, is this an argument that there's really no state action? Is that, is that what you're arguing? No, Your Honor. I, there, there is a state action in the form of a statute. I, I do agree with that. There is no standing here because the plaintiff's injury is not traceable to the statute. Well, I'm not sure I understand that, whether you call it state action or standing. Uh, isn't it the case that the day before this statute, uh, and indeed the day before Bruin, uh, uh, the uh, plaintiff, uh, could have entered Macy's, because uh, he has a permit for a carry permit, right? Uh, he could have entered Macy's with no problem, whether or not Macy's, unless Macy's had a sign in the front saying, we don't allow guns in here, he'd be fine. After this statute, he's no longer fine. Isn't it the statute that has made the difference? No, Your Honor. It is the decision of Macy's not to make its consent to the well, entry how do you with know, firearms. How do you no. know they've made a decision? Well, As we, opposed to just going on doing their business. They're in the business of selling shirts and underwear. They're not in the business of making public policy. Well, Your Honor, they are in the business of opening a store that is open to the public and operating against the background legal principles that govern all property owners. What the statute did is change the background legal principles that govern the decision making of property owners. Yeah, but why is, isn't that? But, but that is uh, uh, to the disadvantage of uh, uh, gun toters, yes? It is not, Your Honor, because the law is entirely neutral as to which decision the but property owner Macy's makes. But maybe Macy's is entirely neutral. I mean, it, you know, I, I was struck by uh, uh, Mr. Christian's uh, uh, telephone calls to uh, uh, business owners. Uh, they said, we don't want to get involved. Uh, and it strikes me that that may be only called a couple of people, but that seems to me to be entirely to be expected. Why would a property owner want to get in the middle of this either way? I mean, if you put the presumption on the other side, uh, you know, you have actually from the First Amendment standpoint, I don't see any difference which way the presumption runs, because either way, you have, if you want something, you have to ask for it, whether the presumption is the gun bearer can come in to a pu public place or can't, whether that's the presumption or not, if you dissent from that or if you want to have a different rule as a property owner, you have to speak up. So all right, and uh, the First Amendment to one side. But why isn't the presumption of the Second Amendment that he's supposed to be able to go in there unless there's an objection. This is not a private house. This is a place that is, generally speaking, open to the public. It becomes like the sidewalk. Well, because again, Your Honor, the, the default rule itself does not serve a determining factor as to the property owner's decision. This case is very similar to Tirani, where a person wanted to buy a gun from a firearm dealer. The dealer ran a background check. An FBI agent showed up at the dealer's door and said, we have some concerns about this person. We are not prohibiting you from selling him the gun, but we have some concerns. And the next day, the dealer said, I can still sell you the gun. The FBI visited me, and I won't, no longer feel comfortable doing so. And what the Sixth Circuit concluded is that the firearm dealer's independent decision completely severed the chain of causation. The FBI agent did not 
cajole, coerce, or com command the dealer in making that decision. And in this case, the, prop the default statute does even less than that. It imposes absolutely no consequences on a private property owner's decision. But even if your honors disagreed and, and concluded that there was standing here, the private property default rule does not implicate the Second Amendment for the reasons that the 11th Circuit concluded in Georgia Carey in evaluating a very analogous statute. And in that case, the court rejected a facial Second Amendment challenge, holding that there is no Second Amendment right to carry firearms onto another person's private property against the wishes of the owner, and that a state statute that serves to vindicate that interest or that right uh, does not give rise to a facial Second Amendment challenge. And does, does Georgia Carey survive Bruin? Like, or what is the, what should we take from it in light of Bruin, I guess? It does survive Bruin, Your Honor. The court was very explicit there that it was deciding Georgia Carey at step one of the inquiry, which Bruin did not displace. It was deciding whether that prohibition, the conduct regulated by that prohibition falls within the scope of the Second Amendment. And Bruin did not displace the approach that courts had taken uh, on that issue. In fact, Bruin blessed that approach to the extent it was guided and governed by history, which the 11th Circuit's decision Would was. you say the same thing about the First Amendment? I mean, I, I assume that uh, Mr. Macy uh, could say, um, I, I don't want to serve communists in my store. And, and when a prominent communist came in, he said, please leave, I don't want to serve you. I, I assume that the private property owner could do that, right? Yes, and I, I maybe even more precisely, both the district court and the plaintiffs agree in this case that a property owner has an absolute right to exclude anyone carrying guns. Right, so, so if the state passed a law saying no communists can go into stores in New York State uh, unless uh, the store puts up a sign saying communists welcome. That doesn't cause any First Amendment problem at all in your view. I don't think that's what the statute does, Your Honor, to the, to the extent you're drawing. I, I thought that's exactly what it analogy. does. It says unless you put up a sign saying gun bearers not welcome, uh, uh, gun bearers are not welcome uh, by order of the state. Well, again, Your Honor, the, under, the historical understanding of the First Amendment and the types of limitations that uh, government can impose on, on speech or on expressive conduct are different than the types of limitations that governments can impose on the Second Amendment. And for all of the reasons that the 11th Circuit Yeah, but you're saying this isn't a restriction by the government on anybody's rights at all. Uh, that's right, Your Honor, because the historic understanding of the Second Amendment is different from the historic understanding of the First Amendment. And in this case, for, for the reasons that Georgia Carey concluded, there was never an understanding of the Second Amendment to allow people to enter property absent somebody's wishes. And the statute in Georgia Carey operated in functionally the same way. What that statute said is that if you wanted to enter a place like a place of worship, with a gun, you had to notify security or management and follow the directions of security or management in, in temporarily storing your gun, securing it, and so forth. Our statute works in functionally the same way. If you want to enter private property with a gun, you have to give notice to the proprietor and get consent. It's sort of the equivalent of open carry in, in that respect, right? That um, uh, one advantage of open carry laws is that uh, at least everybody knows what they're dealing with. Uh, and here, if uh, we're allowing concealed carry, uh, then someone entering uh, private premises, uh, the uh, premises owner is not on notice. Is that, is that sort of what we're talking about here? I don't think so, Your Honor. I think oh. the interest that is being protected by the Georgia statute and, and by New York statute is the, the interest in uh, kind of giving property owners all the information they need to assess the risks that are happening on their property. And I know I'm almost out of, out of time, but I would like to just briefly address the fact that even at step two of, the, of Bruin's inquiry, the state has met its burden by citing eight different historical provisions from seven different jurisdictions that also function to bar persons from entering private property with a firearm absent receiving consent. The plaintiffs and the district court have, have drawn various uh, quibbles with the historical historical evidence, but none of those really overcome the historical tradition. Do any of, of them concern places that are otherwise open to the public? None of them actually make that distinction, Your Honor, uh, and we think that's important because that reflects that there was no historic understanding of the Second Amendment that made that distinction in the way that the district court focused on. 
All of those statutes required somebody to receive consent, sometimes even in writing, uh, from the property owner before entering their property with a firearm. Uh, the district court, in this case, and in Antonyuk, primarily characterized these statutes, how statutes many, as- How many shops, how many stores, how many restaurants have people standing at the door vetting who is gonna come in and who may not? A restaurant will vet who has a reservation, but your system would require there to be this additional person who is going to, um, to, to stand at the door and question people. Your Honor, the law does not require that. The law provides many different mechanisms by which an owner can give consent. They can post a sign. They can post a statement on their website. They can train their staff members, for example, taking reservations, to state that they either provide consent or they do not provide consent. They can post a person like that outside the door, or they can have a recorded phone message. The statute provides many different mechanisms by which this, ex this express consent can be conveyed, which really reflects that the facial challenge here it is doubly inappropriate. And I see that I am over my time, so we'll reserve the rest for rebuttal. All right, All right thank, thank you. you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Pete Patterson for the appellees. New York's no-carry default is a paradigmatic example of the state's attempt to circumvent the Bruin decision. As academics who promoted this idea indicated, it has the potential to radically expand the number of de jure gun-free zones. But that is not a goal New York is permitted to pursue. Quickly on standing, this case is unlike every other case that the other side is cited on standing because it's a direct criminal prohibition on the plaintiff. The Tarani case, every other case, was an example where there was indirect harm. The government regulated somebody else, and that indirectly, allegedly, harmed the plaintiff. But that's not the case here. This is a direct criminal prohibition on the plaintiff in this case, and that gives rise to standing. What do we make, though, of the fact that liability only is only possible at the sort of action of, of a third party? Well, that's not true, Your Honor. The third party can do nothing. It's a no-carry default that says you are subject of a felony if you go onto somebody else's property with a gun, unless they waive that prohibition. And it's similar to the structure in the Clinton versus City of New York case, which we cited, which there was a Medicaid obligation that New York was going to have to bear. And then there was a law that removed that obligation, but the president did a line item veto <clears throat> Nevertheless, the HHS still could have waived that obligation, and there was, in fact, a waiver application in front of the HHS. But the court said that that doesn't affect standing because there's the government action of removing the benefit of the, in the first place. The fact that somebody else could waive it does not affect standing, and it's the same analysis here. With respect to the merits, first, plain text. The plain text gives individuals a right to carry. There's no locational distinction in the plain text. So we go oh, to- Wait, wait. I mean, yes. that means that uh, you carrying a gun could come into my house uh, carrying a gun if I didn't want you to. That's with respect to the plain text. That's not even the, the plain but, but text. That, but that, is that what the plain text means? That I can't, I can't say, but, I'm sorry, I don't want you in my house if you're carrying a gun. Yes, and that's what Bruin, no, well, the plain text does not establish the result. The plain text is only, is the Second Amendment implicated? Bruin is not a two-step test, it's a one-step test. First, you decide Sounds whether- Sounds like a two-step test. I mean, well, it, it, this is a little arcane. I guess it doesn't matter whether it's a yes. two-step test or a one-step te test. <laughs> but you're saying, first we have this, and then we have that. And yes. some things come into play at this stage, and some right. things come the into first, play at that stage. The first step, or the first stage, is, is the Second Amendment even implicated? And there, you look at the plain text. And as Bruin said, nothing in the plain text draws a home public distinction or a home anywhere else distinction. You're not going to find in the plain text a restriction on carrying anywhere. But then the government has the burden at history. And then so, for example, the court looked at sensitive places. That was a matter of history. And similarly- But my house is, not, house a, my house is not a more sensitive place than any other house. Well, as a matter of history, I suspect you would not have the right to bring a firearm into oh, someone's and we're gonna, home. And we're going to say this is, you have a right to come in because- uh, but maybe not because we suspect something? No, I mean, don't we not, have to be thinking about right what, the, what, the, what the situations actually are? You do not have a right to bring a firearm into someone's home without their 
with, against their express consent, but that's because of history. It's not because of the plain text. That's the only point I'm and making. And what history are you citing for that? I'm citing the historical uh, laws that give property owners the right to say, we don't want someone to come in here with a gun or with anything else, for that matter. Mm -hmm. So that is the history. But basically, what, trespass law. Yes, yeah, basically trespass law. But, but here, how is that this, distinct from? Which I'm sorry, yeah, you, sure. pro you probably were getting yeah. ready to address yes. that. But how is that distinct from what we're talking about, private property store owners? Because, again, this notion that uh, in the briefs it says a lot about um, uh, private property open to the public, yes. and that distinction. I mean, it's as Judge Lynch was uh, alluding to. It's not in the text, and so if there's uh, if private property open to the public cannot have this kind of consent requirement, why would that be any different with regard to private property uh, of, regarding Judge Lynch's home? I mean, it how is be, it different? It would be the same analytical structure. We do afford the home heightened protection and various constitutional rights, so perhaps that would be a different result for the home. But here we're but speaking- Perhaps it wouldn't? I mean, uh, perhaps it wouldn't. We would have to do that analysis. We have brought a claim as applied only to places open to the public, so we have not run that analysis for homes, it could be a different outcome. But with respect to places open to the public, But we're gonna have to make history. a rule, you see, yes. right? We're gonna have to explain what right. the scope of the Second Amendment is. Right. And you're suggesting that we should make a rule that governs private property open to the public, and then just say, well, I mean, maybe the same rule would apply to anybody's house. We can't tell? Well, you would say, as a matter of plain text, individuals have, it's just a right to carry. And then it's the government's burden to prove that their restriction is consistent with the nation's history. And you would hold, with respect to places open, open to the public, the government has not met that burden. They would have an opportunity, if it was my home, to meet that burden, to have a l rule like this in place. But they haven't tried to meet it in this case because that's not what it issued, is at issue in this case. So it would be, it, it, with respect to this rule, the government has not met the burden. And, a very, uh, the other side has cited the Georgia Kerry case, but the better precedent is the Brown versus Entertainment Merchants case in the, in the First Amendment context in the Supreme Court, footnote three, there, which was a law that barred the sale of violent video games to minors. And there was an argument that this is essentially just a parental consent law because the parents can still purchase the video games and give them to minors. And there was an argument that at the founding, parents had essentially uh, complete control over children, so there can't possibly be a right of children to access these video games. And what the Supreme Court said in footnote three of that decision is no, maybe if this law had said for parents who object, then the state can enforce that, that would be okay. But this is different. We're inserting state authority, state control at the first step and saying you have to affirmatively seek parental consent. And the Supreme Court said the history does not support that. And that is the same result that is uh, at issue here. The history simply does not support the state inserting itself and saying you need to affirmatively seek consent before you're able to carry somewhere. Their analogs are game laws from the founding, which the vast majority of them applied only to enclosed lands. These were not places where people generally had the right to be in the first place. And, uh, and they all, the motivation was abusive hunting practices. And what's interesting here is the motivation, the why, Bruin says you look at the how and the why. The why is that now we have to comply with the Second Amendment after Bruin, and there are going to be a lot more people exercising their Second Amendment rights, so we need to do something about that. So that why is diametrically opposed. The harm is not any abusive behavior. These are people who have made it through New York's licensing process. But the you know, harm when you're is interpreting that text, don't we have to pay some attention to the why at the time? I mean, actually, lots of people had no right to bear arms uh, at the time of the First Amendment. True? Uh, at the time of the Second Amendment, at yes. At the Second Amendment, yeah. Um, there were some people, there were... Well, uh, all people of color, for example, yes, in many states, absolutely. right, were, were yes. prohibited from carrying guns. That's a lot of people. Well, and that is not reflective of the Second Amendment. That is reflective of the bigotry of that time, and it's interesting New York here is relying on well, but, but of whatever, the black whatever. I mean, so they were bigots, but they were bigots who did not think that lots of people had the right to bear arms. Right, but that's it's part not, of the historical understanding, isn't right, it? Right, but here we're not dealing with people who don't have the right to bear arms. What well, but as you, and as told, you said before, the the hunting statutes, I, I, I'm quite in agreement with you, were aimed at a particular abuse. 
So when they saw an abuse, they were able to deal with it, notwithstanding any assumed right to bear arms. But when there was no particular abuse, I mean, I'm not sure that we have a lot of uh, historical examples of people coming with guns into somebody's house uh, against their will. Uh, right. uh, we don't have a lot of that, do we? We're not claiming a right to come into anybody's house with a gun against their and will. And what about, what about stores? We're not claiming a right to come into a store against the stone or store owner's will. What we're saying is that the state cannot bar us from going into a store unless and until that store affirmatively says that we can come in there. Historic trespass law, which we are not opposing, would what? say if someone says you can't, then we can't. Well, but except historic trespass law says you can't come in my house, period unless I affirmatively consent. You right. can't just say, well, I'm assuming that I have the right to come into your right. house. Right, yes, we're not saying we have a right to come into your house, but these are businesses open to the public. These, and Heller uh, Bruin used the phrase, places frequented by the public repeatedly, because New York, for one of the plaintiff's application, says you can have a right to carry, but not in places frequented by the public. So you are drawing public. a distinction between houses and uh, uh, places that are open to the public. Yes, and the, the technical point I was making is that that is a matter of history not as a matter of the plain text does not draw any locational distinctions. So it, that is a, at the historical stage of the analysis. So that was the only distinction I was trying to draw, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. And my time is up, but I'm happy to answer any further questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Your Honors. Uh, the plaintiff's argument regarding the meaning of the Second Amendment does not comport with the history of private property law that informed the historical understanding of the Second Amendment. As the court explained in Georgia Carey, the property rights, the historic property rights of owners of homes and owners of businesses were not distinguished with respect to the right to exclude gun owners. That is not reflected in the text of the Second Amendment, as plaintiffs agree. It is also not a distinction that is reflected in the underlying property law itself. And for that reason, this challenge fails at step one of the But analysis. doesn't the underlying property law make um, uh, a, a pretty clear distinction between places where there is an open invitation to the public and places where there isn't? In other words, uh, uh, you can't go into Macy's without Macy's permission, but Macy's declares that it's open to the public. No one makes that assumption about my home, but they do make that assumption about Macy's, and for good reason, because Macy's wants customers. Uh, so it, what is the logic of saying that we assume, unless they declare otherwise, that uh, Macy's doesn't want certain customers? Well, Your Honor, an assumption has to be made. In this context, property law would require a default rule as to the meaning of silence. Either it implies consent or it implies non-consent. Now, legislatures have the freedom to choose between which one they think is better as a policy matter. But for the plaintiffs to prevail here, you would have to conclude that the Second Amendment requires one of those defaults. And there is, again, nothing in the text of the Second Amendment or the historic understanding of the Second Amendment that mandates that conclusion. And with respect to plaintiffs' arguments about the quality of the state's historical evidence, there are just a few things that I would like to flag. Uh, four of these laws do not mention hunting at all. All of these laws prohibit carrying guns onto someone else's prop private property regardless of a hunting or anti-hunting motivation. At least two of the laws do not mention enclosed premises. And all of these laws, even if each of them was motivated by a concern about hunting, all of these laws are, support the state's ability to pass such a prohibition to address modern concerns and considerations, including about property damage to modern property and the lives of people uh, on that property. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your right. Honors. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you both. We'll take this under advisement, and we are ready to call the next case which is uh, Jimmy Hardaway Jr., Larry A. Boyd et al., um, B. Stephen Negrelli, or excuse me, uh, and Brian D. Seaman and B. Stephen Negrelli as well. Whenever you're ready. <laughs> <laughs>
Hello again. May it please the court, Esther Murdukaeva for the state defendant. New York properly designated places of worship as sensitive locations in which firearms could not be carried, and the injunction should be reversed. We make a threshold step one argument in our brief, but this morning I'd like to focus on the district court's errors in evaluating the state's historical evidence. The state met any burden to support the place of worship provision in two different ways. First, the state's expert identified numerous direct historical predecessors for prohibitions on firearms in places of worship. And second, the state's expert explained how places of worship are relevantly similar to other types of historically recognized sensitive locations. The district court erroneously discarded the state's highly pertinent evidence based on various categorical rules that have no basis in ruin and are illogical as a method of historical study. I'll begin with the first limitation that was imposed by the district court. Uh, the district court concluded that historic sensitive places are limited to those that implicate key features of democracy. That is a term that appears nowhere in Bruin, it appears nowhere in Heller, and for good reason, both of those cases recognize that locations such as schools are historically recognized as sensitive, and schools obviously do not implicate key features of democracy. There is also no basis for such a limitation in the historical record, as the historical record includes numerous prohibitions on carrying firearms in places like ballrooms or gatherings for educational, social, or literary purposes. Again, these do not implicate key features of democracy. Next, the court imposed uh, an amorphous and somewhat I'm not undefined- sure why you wanna, I'm not sure why you wanna give that away. Uh, I would think that schools are pretty essential to democracy, and maybe churches too. Uh, uh, churches are like, uh, are, are the religious equivalent of the secular places that you just mentioned that are gatherings for uh, uh, literary, et cetera, uh, uh, purposes, uh, uh, social, literary, artistic. Uh, uh, churches are at least that and more so because of the importance of, of religious observance, yes? Well, Your Honor, I, I guess I, would, I was disputing the district court's mm. definition of key functions of democracy, mm. which seem to be limited to things like the operation of governmental entities. That is simply much too narrow to be a, a classification or a description for the types of locations that have been found sensitive. Uh, but more importantly, Your Honors, we did identify numerous prohibition, historic prohibitions on firearms in places of worship. Bruin states that the state is not required to identify historical twins at all, and we agree. But in this case, we have numerous historical twins. And what the district court concluded is that the state failed to meet some amorphous, continuous, or enduring tradition standard. And is that, is your, your conception of what makes this a sensitive place, is it based, uh, I don't know if you're relying primarily on this historical analysis or characteristics that are analogous to the, the uh, sort of named sensitive places? What's the, how do we determine uh, not just whether or not places of worship are sensitive places, but generally, how do we make that, that determination of what is a sensitive place? Sure, there are two different pathways, Your Honor. A uh, sensitive place can be sensitive because it is identical to historical sensitive place locations, or independently, because it shares uh, features of relevant similarity with other historical places. Places of worship satisfy both tests. In this case, we have numerous examples of historical prohibitions on carrying firearms in places of worship that, again, the court discounted because it concluded they were not enduring enough or because it concluded that 19th century uh, examples are irrelevant, neither of which are supported by Bruin or because places of worship share these features, uh, these similar features with other historical places, such as the ones that Your Honor was referring to uh, that protect the exercise of constitutional rights. There are historical sensitive places that protect vulnerable populations that are concentrated in a particular place as they are in churches. And there are historical sensitive place pr uh, restrictions that are focused on the particular risk that use of firearms places, uh, present in particularly crowded areas with limited forms of egress. Uh, not only does that pose a heightened risk of gun-related injury or death, but it can create risk of, of chaos or panic from the presence of firearms. So uh, in this case, either one of those paths apply. Uh, there may be other cases where one path makes more sense than another, uh, but either one is as a way to establish a historical tradition for sensitive place regulation. Uh, one a feature of the district court's reasoning that was 
particularly erroneous is its refusal to consider post-founding laws as uh, relevant evidence of the state's histor of the nation's historical tradition of firearms. Bruin only authorizes diminishing uh, post-founding laws if there is an affirmative conflict with earlier law. No such conflict exists here. What the plaintiffs have pointed to are several co colonial rules that required bringing a gun to church, but a government mandate is not the same thing as a constitutional right. The 11th Circuit recently clarified that in the Bondi case, which presented a very similar circumstance. In that case, uh, the challenge was to an age limitation on the possession of firearms. And the court said there is no conflict between that rule and colonial era regulations that require people of a certain age to muster for a militia. And that is because the plaintiffs there were confusing a legal obligation with a constitutional right. Merely by regulating conduct, the government does not create a constitutional right to the conduct that is being regulated. In addition, the district court categorically discarded uh, many local laws. Several of the provisions that the state cited were um, regulations enacted by localities. And that is deeply and fundamentally problematic when you're trying to ascertain the nation's historical tradition of firearms regulation. It was localities that, for most of this nation's history, were tasked with regulating for public safety. It was localities that would have been tasked with regulating things like the presence of firearms uh, in particularly sensitive locations. By categorically dismissing this evidence, the court actually narrowed the historical record into something that no longer reflects an accurate understanding of the historical regulation of firearms in this country. Uh, one other, uh, one last point that I'd like to address about the arguments that the plaintiffs have made is that they contend that there are some self-defense exceptions in certain of the historical place of worship provisions, uh, but the, the cases that they cite do not actually reflect a statutory self-defense exception. Those cases, Brownlee and Wilforth, uh, merely recognized and rejected a particular defendant's attempt to assert a common law justification defense. Um, that is not the same thing as concluding that there is an affirmative self-defense exception in any of the statutes, much less concluding that it was an exception that basically swallowed the rule that would allow anyone to carry a gun into a sensitive location at any time just simply by asserting that they have an interest in carrying uh, for self-defense. What Bruin and Heller recognized in recognizing the sensitive place doctrine is that the Second Amendment does allow governments to prohibit categorically the presence of firearms in sensitive locations, even if there are people who want to carry firearms in those places for self-defense. Thank you, Your Honors. Good morning, Your Honors, uh, and may it please the court. John Ohlendorf for the Appellees. The Supreme Court's recent Bruin decision squarely holds that this court's role in Second Amendment challenges is determined whether the challenge restriction is consistent with the, with the Second Amendment's text and its history. Now here, the plain text of the Second Amendment obviously covers the course of conduct that the plaintiffs wish to engage in and would be engaging in were it not for New York's ban on carrying firearms in places of worship. Plaintiffs are Americans and they wish to carry bearable arms. Under Bruin, that suffices to shift the burden to New York to establish based on history, in, Bruin, in Bruin's words, that its regulation is uh, consistent with the nation's historic tradition of firearm regulation. Now, New York effectively concedes that until 1870, not a single colony, state, territory, city, or town had any restriction on carrying firearms that was specific to places of worship. And even starting in the late date of 1870, the only such laws that New York is able to scrounge together come from a handful of cities, uh, four states, and two territories. And Bruin itself establishes that, that even those provisions are not reflective of the nation's uh, historical so tradition. Are, are we assuming that all of the other states that did not have such uh, uh, prohibitions thought there was a constitutional right, or just that they didn't have a need or a problem with uh, people bringing guns to churches? Well, Your Honor, I, it, Number one, it's, uh, it is the state's burden to come forward to show a historic tradition that they get to regulate in these spaces. Doesn't it make a difference uh, uh, when, you're looking at, when you're looking at regulations that the state can do? I mean, no state, the Second Amendment didn't have anything to do with states uh, in 1791, right? Well, Your Honor, uh, it's, under only, it's only around the time that these regulations come into play. 
that the state is citing that uh, the Second Amendment even hypothetically applies to the states. Well, I mean, we Lynn didn't figure that out until much later. Uh, but in 1868, the, uh, the current uh, historical understanding is that uh, the Bill of Rights almost entirely uh, apply, are applied to the state through the 14th Amendment. Well, Judge Lynch, a couple of answers to that. First, uh, a number of state courts, uh, my understanding is, did not necessarily agree with uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Barron versus Baltimore and thought that uh, the Bill of Rights applied to them as sort of a uh, general common law proposition. But more importantly, uh, most states had, uh, had state analogs to the Second Amendment mm -hmm. in their own constitutions, uh, which tracked and, uh, Heller says, helped to define the, the scope of the pre-existing right that's incorporated into the Second Amendment. And that's why Heller and Bruin looked to state practice during this period as the most instructive, the most instructive uh, form of history for determining the scope of the Second Amendment at the time that it was ratified. And uh, if the state wants to come forward, forward with some kind of historical evidence suggesting that, well, you know, nobody is regulating these areas, but we all think we could. Well, but when, they, when the uh, states started to uh, uh, impose these regulations about churches. They didn't just do it, they did it, and either no one challenged it, or when someone did challenge it, courts said, in respect to their state constitutions mostly, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. That was the response, the, the virtually unanimous response of courts uh, to arguments that were made at the time against these laws. Does yes, that Judge, not matter? Yes, Judge Lynch, but if you look at those opinions, for example, uh, State versus English, State versus Hill, those cases are premised on an understanding of the Second Amendment that's, uh, that is malicious-centric and that we know from Heller and we know from Bruin uh, is an outlier, at the time even, an outlier understanding of the scope of the Second Amendment. And Bruin says uh, that that significantly lessens the type, the, the amount of historical weight we can place on those, on those decisions. Uh, a, a state court, a decision by the Texas Supreme Court that says, we think that's ridiculous. You want to carry firearms into, into church? There's no right to serve in a militia in church. That tells us nothing about the scope of the Second Amendment that, that we have under Heller and that we have under Bruin. How do we know that isn't the understanding at the time of what the uh, Second Amendment meant? After all, until 2008, that's what the Supreme Court thought about uh, uh, the Second Amendment. Well, well, Your Honor, somewhat that, his, uh, selective reading of history that we're engaged in Judge, here. Isn't Judge it? Lynch, and that's what the District of Columbia argued in the Heller case. That's what New York argued in the Bruin case. The Supreme Court has rejected that proposition twice, and specifically held in Bruin that that the fact that these state Supreme Court decisions are grounded in this mistaken understanding of the Second Amendment strips them of authority in determining what the historic scope of the Second Amendment mm -hmm. is. Uh, so, Your Honor, I think. Um, uh, the, the state is left with uh, these, these laws from four states, two territories, a handful of, uh, of, of uh, city ordinances. That's plainly insufficient, Your Honor. We would submit for them to, uh, uh, to bear their burden under Bruin to justify, to show a historic tradition justifying their, uh, their law. And, and just, I, I want to make sure I understand correctly, Although one of, in the next case that we're going to be hearing, we've got a First Amendment argument about this uh, uh, that applies specifically to pastors. Uh, I, I take it that's not your argument. You no, may agree Honor. with it uh, yourself, but I mean that's not an argument that's being made here. My plaintiffs don't have any First Amendment. You're arguing claim. just on the Second case. Amendment. That's so that would apply to anybody, not just the, the pastors or not just someone who had a particular religious belief. Anyone could go into a church with a gun. That's correct, Your Honor. That's, that's our view, for, uh, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, Bruin says to begin with the text, and I do want to uh, address the text. Um, we can, think I just, the, can I just yes, ask Judge you Lee. sort of a, a big picture question? This entire sort of doctrine, or if you, I'm, I'm calling it a doctrine, that, that's addressed in Bruin about uh, presumptively, law, presumptively <laughs> uh, lawful or sensitive places. How does that, in your view, factor into this analysis? I mean, putting aside the question of whether or not places of worship are in fact, sensitive locations. How, in general, how does this sensitive location concept affect the analysis? Or is your view that essentially it, it has no meaning or it has no relevance? Yes, Your Honor. So, so the way that we view it is uh, Bruin establishes a, a burden-shifting framework. Uh, it begins by placing the burden on the plaintiffs to show that their uh, course of conduct comes within the plain meaning of the text, or what Bruin elsewhere says, the bare text. Uh, 
Um, and the uh, Supreme Court has defined the relevant terms. It's defined who constitutes presumptively the people. It's defined what it means to bear arms. And so in, in this case, at least, and I think in most cases, it's pretty easy for a plaintiff to meet that threshold uh, that threshold uh, showing, which then shifts the burden onto the state to demonstrate a historical tradition supporting its law, either that it falls directly within uh, uh, a type of, uh, of restriction that was recognized at the founding, or that is sufficiently analogous to that. Um, and sensitive places is one uh, one piece of, of that type of showing that the court has taken it as settled. Yeah. That so how do we decide what is sufficiently analogous? The only things that uh, the Supreme Court tells us, I guess by way of dictum in Bruin, are historically analogous to the only things that they list as sensitive places recognized at the founding, which are basically state capitals, polling places, and courthouses. I'm glad they had courthouses on the list. I'm sure Justice Thomas was too. Uh, but the only things they said were analogous were government buildings and schools. They didn't tell us why. Your and I'm Honor, not sure I understand why. I mean, a social security office, a post office is like the state capital, I guess, but I'm not sure why. Schools are like the state capital, I don't know why. The only thing they told us was not analogous is the island of Manhattan. And that gave me some puzzlement because, uh, after all, if we're uh, told also in Bruin that we should look to see whether there's been uh, dramatic technological or sociological change, it seems to me that a 18th century person transported to the island of Manhattan would find that a much more radically different place than anything whatever in his experience, whereas a school would not be. So I'm, I'm just puzzled. How do you go about this in your view? Judge Lynch, a couple of points. First, uh, we do not agree that, that Bruin holds that much. We don't think it says that schools and, and all government buildings oh, so are schools, analogous. I mean, at least according to the theory that you would have us apply, schools are open fair game. School, uh, for somebody, you, your client doesn't care about going into a school with a gun, but if somebody did, Bruin has nothing to say about that. That might be perfectly unconstitutional for the state to regulate guns in schools. Judge Lynch, schools were not presented in Bruin. They're not presented here. There is a separate historical category of laws that prevent students from carrying firearms in schools. Well, in, in a couple of universities. I thought we weren't looking at just a couple of places under your argument. If there's only two, the University of Virginia, and I forget what the other one was, uh, those uh, which aren't anything like public schools, your same arguments would carve that up. Your Honor, um, uh, with, I think there are more than a couple, but th the issue of schools is simply not, it's not, schools are not regulated by this law. It's not I understand, but case. once again, well, schools are regulated by this law. Uh, so one of the things that we have to do here is not just throw out a bunch of thunderbolts, we have to do some kind of analysis that applies to what are sensitive locations and what aren't. And the kind of rule that we make is going to have profound implications, at least until the, sec the Supreme Court tells us we're wrong, uh, for all of these kinds of institutions that are governed by this law. And some of them, we're gonna have to make these decisions essentially today, I mean, in cases that are being argued today. Uh, so I'm really, I don't think you can just say, uh, we're just talking churches here and we don't have to address the larger problem of how do we go about deciding what are and what are not sensitive locations. D Judge Lee, I see I'm over time. May I briefly respond? Yes, please. Uh, so, so Judge Lynch, uh, let me give you the principle that we would propose for determining mm -hmm. uh, what is sufficiently analogous to, a to one of the sensitive places recognized in brewing as obtaining at the founding. We think the unifying uh, feature of those locations is that the government provided comprehensive security and that that was both why, looking to Bruins, the how much and the why, uh, that is why uh, uh, there was not a significant burden on the individual right to self-defense uh, in preventing carrying arms in those places because the government had undertook uh, for the people who were uh, present in those places, had taken over uh, the job of, of being armed and ready in case of confrontation. And we think that's also the why. 
uh, the reason uh, why uh, firearms could be uh, wholly uh, banned in those locations is that the government had secured them. And there's this historical evidence of the types of security that was uh, provided at the founding in these locations in the Center for Human Liberty amicus brief in the Antonia case. But that's, that's the feature uh, that we believe defines uh, the scope of what's sufficiently analogous today to the sensitive locations at the founding. Uh, we think uh, schools uh, fall under a separate historical category, uh, which was, as the Mahoney Area School District versus BL Supreme Court case says, that was the state's in loco parentis uh, authority to act on behalf of uh, the parents uh, when it was dealing with students at the schools. That's the, the historical category that we see uh, schools falling within, but schools were not presented in Bruin, they're not presented here. Okay. All right, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, geez. Oh, too quickly. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, I'm appearing, my name is Brian Crosby. I'm appearing on behalf of Brian Seaman, who is the District Attorney of Niagara County, on a very narrow issue. And the issue here is whether or not the preliminary injunction be, should be maintained until an ultimate decision is made on the constitutionality of this, this particular statute. It's our position that the stay is improper and that the judge had sufficient basis to institute a preliminary injunction. Uh, holding that back with the stay puts the district attorney, our district attorney in Niagara County, in a conundrum in that he is being asked to potentially prosecute violations of this law if someone goes into a church carrying a legally, previously legally carrying a firearm. Uh, and then if the, if the statute is found to be unconstitutional downstream, after the matter has been prosecuted as a class E felony, then having to relieve in some fashion or uh, the prior conviction of what until this statute went into effect would be an ordinary law abiding citizen who would take a firearm appropriately, legally, as Reverend Hartway indicated he did in a difficult area of the city. I'm, uh, I'm not sure I understand. Doesn't uh, your client have discretion over what cases to prosecute? Sure he does. And he is, is it not relevant? Doesn't he, like judges, uh, dealing with what to do in the interim? Wouldn't it be a reasonable exercise of prosecutorial discretion to say, look, this is still unsettled? Uh, it, it may be that there's no prohibition on my enforcing this law, uh, but I think uh, at least unless somebody goes in and shoots up the place, in which case we can prosecute them without any question, uh, uh, in the unlikely event that I mean, what, somebody's going to make a test case just to test your client uh, uh, up there, I mean, why, why is there not just discretion to say, I'm going to stay my hand at least on I mean, I don't even know what he has to say on what uh, at this point. We'll see, wait and see what happens. Well, I think then what you're suggesting, Your Honor, and what uh, the state has suggested in their uh, responsive brief is that the district attorney, in essence, substitute himself for the court and de facto issue an injunction until the decision. No, he's not doing anything involving injunctions. He's not binding anybody else. He's not even telling the police what to do, I take it. Uh, he's doing what district attorneys do all the time. Of the many categories of offenses that exist uh, under the law, uh, he's deciding which ones are worthy of prosecution. And if he sees one that he thinks is worthy of prosecution, he can bring it. And, uh, and nothing, at least at the moment, uh, uh, stops him from doing so. Uh, if he, uh, you know, if there was an injunction against him, then he couldn't. Now he can, or if he thinks it's an appropriate prosecution to bring, and if he thinks it's not, I don't see what make it, uh, obligates him to bring a case. Well, he is sworn to uphold the law. He is sworn to uphold this law, and the state has indicated that they intend to arrest and go forward with this arrest. Well, why, who, why can't the district this? attorney uh, rely uh, uh, on a principled basis on, on the, uh, the, the, the rule of lenity, which says if there's some controversy as to whether 
this law applies or should apply or can be prosecuted, you don't do it. Well, I, I think, I guess my reaction to that, Your Honor, is you're telling the district attorney if you have people who are charged with e-felonies and the, the state troopers have come forward and indicated that they have a clear case of a violation of an e-felony, that he should stand back until the decision is made by this court. I'm not saying, no one's saying he should. That's his discretion, that's his power, that's his authority. Uh, I'm sure there are other cases where police officers bring him cases of e-felonies and the decision is, eh, no, we're just not gonna do that. Uh, and they don't. Isn't that right? I mean, isn't that what district attorneys do? That's their job, is to decide what cases are worthy of prosecution in their view. And if they have constitutional reservations, they're also uh, uh, obliged to uh, follow those, at least until some court tells them you must do this or you must do that. Well, I believe, Your Honor, that the, that puts a district attorney in a very difficult decisional position. That's why they pay him the big bucks. <laughs> I used to do that for a living at one time. Uh, and we were making decisions all the time that were hard, difficult decisions about what cases were worthy of prosecution and what weren't. And some of those were based on the determination that we have limited resources, some laws are more important than others, and we have to put our resources where it counts and not where uh, it doesn't. I mean, that, that seems to me like the whole job of the man. Well, I, I guess my reaction to that, Your Honor, is that the prosecutor would be bound to follow the law, to prosecute clear cases that are felony violations. In Germany, that's true. I mean, in, in many European countries, there's a, what's called the rule of compulsory prosecution. But that's never been the rule in the United States with respect to district attorneys. They can decide to exercise mercy in particular cases and not, uh, not bring them. And no one can bring a, a lawsuit to make them. A victim can't make the district attorney uh, uh, bring a prosecution. If the prosecutor decides, well, this is a clear case of shoplifting, but the guy's sorry and he's poor and we got bigger fish to fry, there are murders to prosecute, we're just gonna let that go. The store owner can't bring a lawsuit to enjoin the prosecutor to prosecute the case. Isn't that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hello, I'd like to make three points on rebuttal. The first is that when you apply the historical twins framework for analyzing uh, comparable relevant uh, sensitive place regulations, the plaintiff's test provides no workable standard. They've said laws from four states, two territories, and multiple local ordinances are not enough. If that is not enough, I don't know what is. And that test would turn Bruin into the regulatory straitjacket that the Supreme Court warned against. Second, Bruin itself does not actually require historical twins. It urges courts to adopt principles of relevant similarities in analyzing modern laws. What the plaintiffs have suggested is that the principles of relevant similarity must look only to the list of sensitive places listed in Bruin. That is actually not consistent with Bruin. Bruin uses the phrase EG before making that list, which is commonly understood not to be exclusive. Bruin says this is not an occasion to comprehensively define sensitive places. If you look to the historical statutes that, that set out sensitive places, they are much, much broader than the list that, set, that is set forth in Bruin. And many of them do in fact date to the late 19th century or to the middle of the 19th century. The sources that Bruin itself cited to support the sensitive places it recognized referenced 19th century prohibitions on firearms in places like legislative assemblies and courthouses. If 19th century statutes were irrelevant, then that portion of Bruin would simply not make sense. The third point that I would like to make is about what to do with founding well, era asylums. If you can rely on 19th century statutes, why not 20th? Well, Your Honor, Bruin does suggest that there is a time when statutes that are too late are too removed from the historical period, but even then. How do I know when that is? Well, but even then, the court does not say that the rule is to exclude consideration of those statutes. What the court says is that if those statutes are inconsistent with affirmative evidence on the other side from an earlier time period, 
then they are less relevant evidence of the historical meaning of the Second Amendment. What the court does not say is that those later laws, whether from the 19th century or early 20th century, can be categorically discarded in the face of founding era silence. That does not make any sense, because to impose that kind of rule would to apply a presumption of constitutionality that presupposes that legislatures are governing at the maximum extent of their constitutional authority at every single time. That has never been a presumption that courts have applied in the Second Amendment or any other context. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll take this matter under advisement. And I think we're ready to call the next case, um, which is uh, Michael Spencer, his tabernacle at all, v. Stephen A. Negrelli. Good to see you again. <laughs> Good to see you as well. <laughs> Esther Marie Ducaeva for the State Defendant. Uh, the place of worship provision is also consistent with the First Amendment. New York's law does not burden the plaintiff's religious practice because by Spencer's own admissions, firearms have no religious significance to his religious practice. And New York's law allows plaintiffs to discharge any religious obligation to protect congregants through alternate means, including through the carriage of firearms consistent with the exceptions for law enforcement and security guards that are applicable to all sensitive locations. The injunction should be reversed. I'll start with the free exercise claim, which fails because there is no burden on Pastor Spencer's religious practice under his own admissions. I would direct the court to page 74 of the record, which is his declaration, where he states, I believe that I have a moral and religious duty to take reasonable measures to protect the safety of those who enter the church. He then says, I believe that providing for the physical safety of the church is my religious act and duty as a pastor. Nowhere in his declaration or in his preliminary injunction hearing testimony does Spencer state that carrying firearms, specifically carrying firearms, has a religious significance to that underlying religious practice. In that way, this case is very similar to the Greenhaven decision from this court, where the court uh, rejected a First Amendment claim, a free exercise claim raised by a Quaker community group uh, based on the rescheduling of a meeting between the community group and incarcerated individuals that had originally been held on Saturdays and was rescheduled to a weekday. And what the court concluded there is that the act of meeting was uh, of religious significance to the Quakers, but the act of meeting on Saturdays was not. And that is the same analog here. The what about the idea, I mean, doesn't he uh, uh, assert that it, he, he views it as his religious and moral duty to personally protect the flock? And so doesn't that change the nature of it? it? It's not described necessarily as, I feel a duty to make sure that my church has security. I feel a duty to personally protect my flock. Well, again, Your Honor, his own statements make clear that carrying firearms is not of religious significance to that duty. He himself does not carry firearms on Sundays so that he can focus on his responsibility in preaching the gospel, or on Thursdays when he teaches his foundational faith course. That's at pages 199, 231, and 233 of the record. Several pastors in his church also do not carry firearms, and he does not consider it a failure of their religious obligation. That's at page 237. Uh, he also does not consider it religiously necessary for every member of his volunteer security team to carry firearms. In fact, he does not know which of them have permits and which do not. That's at pages 224 to 225 of the record. For that reason, you simply don't get to the analysis of neutrality and general applicability because this case is exactly like Greenhaven. As the 11th well, Circuit again said exactly in- Well, it's not exactly like Greenhaven. Well, We're not in a prison to start with. Uh, which, which profoundly influences that whole decision, right? I mean, no, this is about the power of a warden to keep order in the prison. All of the justifications that were offered have to do with that obligation. It's a rather different scenario. 
Well, Your Honor, the free exercise claim in that case was brought by the non-incarcerated community group mm. members, and the discussion of the burden on religious practice was about the burden on them, about their ability to take time off from work to attend on the weekdays, or their ability Indeed to- Indeed so, and the, come into the prison at a time when the prison is overburdened with visitors and has to take extra security obligations. And this is, a, this is not, we're not talking about, we're talking about apples and oranges here for sure. Well, I think the setting that we're talking about may be apples and oranges is your honor, but the concept of how one evaluates burden on a religious practice is quite the same. As the 11th Circuit said in Georgia Carey, the free exercise clause protects religious beliefs, not secular preferences. And that is exactly what this court noted in Greenhaven. The inconveniences to the community group in that case were meaningful. Fewer people might be able to attend the meetings, fewer people might be able to take time off, but the court was clear. Don't we have to accept the pleading that the, that a pastor um, believes that he has the personal religious obligation to protect his flock. And if that is so, then why, why uh, can the state uh, prevent him from designating which of the members of his, uh, of his um, um, uh, congregation can provide um, uh, security. Uh, you can designate who will be the ushers and who will be in the choir. Uh, why not for security as well? Well, because again, Your Honor, taking Pastor Spencer's own words from his declaration and testimony, he does believe he has a religious obligation to protect his flock. He at no point says that firearms are a component of that religious belief or have religious significance. But it would be one way of implementing that religious obligation, would it not? It might be, but there's no religious significance to that way. And that is exactly what the 11th Circuit said in Georgia Carey. The free exercise clause protects religious beliefs, but not secular preferences. To the extent there is a secular preference to carry firearms in order to uh, carry out a religious obligation, that does not transform carrying well, firearms I mean, into I, religious the activity. The pastor has the ability to, to designate people who would say, you know, please, please don't shoot at this you know, at this congregation, but that's not very effective. Well, presumably, I, I presumably, since this whole matter is about um, the uh, the carrying of arms, we're talking about guns. Well, if your honor is referring to the establishment clause claim. That really does fail for very similar reasons, because by Spencer's own admissions, firearms play no overt role in church operations. He has never discussed firearms with his supervising bishop. He has never discussed firearms with his congregation. So to the extent you're referring to the Establishment Clause claim, it really fails for similar reasons. But even if, for purposes of the free exercise claim, you moved on to neutrality and general applicability, the state would still prevail. The purpose of the neutrality and general applicability inquiry is to ferret out government discrimination against religious activity. You do that by looking at what activity is being regulated and how. That's actually exactly what the Supreme Court did in the Roman Catholic Diocese case. It concluded that the state, in that case, was targeting worship services, the activity of worship services. Here, what New York's law targets is the carrying of firearms into certain sensitive locations, including places of worship. So as long as you've got enough sensitive locations on the, in the rest of your law that are analogous to churches in the appropriate ways, then you get past those pandemic cases. Is that the notion? Well, we have several different theories of the relevant comparators, mm -hmm. each of which mean that those pandemic cases are not applicable. The first theory is that you look to the activity that is being regulated, and in this case, the activity that is being regulated is carrying a gun. So even if you accept that Pastor Spencer is carrying a gun for a religious purpose, the plaintiffs do not assert that that mere act is always necessarily or predominantly a religious activity nor do they assert that the act of carrying a firearm for religious purposes is treated any differently than the act of carrying a firearm for purely secular purposes. And even if you think that the right comparator is place-based, then you're right, Your Honor, the right form of comparison is between places of worship and other secular locations, where the act, oh, other secular sensitive locations, where the act of carrying firearms is treated identically. What the plaintiffs argue is that the right comparator is between places of worship and non uh, non-sensitive secular locations, but that is not 
the right form of comparison. And it's not the right form of comparison because the designation of places of worship as sensitive is based on secular considerations about the specific risks to public safety that are posed by firearms in sensitive locations. What, what about malls? I mean, the people, crazy people shoot up malls all the time. So isn't that, um, isn't that a, uh, a, uh, a sensitive location that is, that is not the subject, that, that, uh, that, that is not regulated while places of worship are regulated? It is not the right comparator, Your Honor, because the state has made a determination that places of worship are uniquely susceptible to risks of shooting by the plaintiff's own acknowledgement, by the description of some of the amici. There have been... Uh, a disproportionate uh, in, threats in, against in, places of in, worship? In this case, we really don't have to decide the question generally because we have admissions that allow us to decide the case without reaching the broader principle. Uh, that's certainly the case with respect to religious burden, Your Honor. I think it's yes. also the case with respect to the comparator. By the plaintiff's own admission, by the admission of amici, there are many threats, many mm -hmm. more threats against places of worship than against other types of non-sensitive secular locations. And the state correctly determined that in light of that additional risk, that it was prudent to exclude guns altogether from places of worship, subject to exceptions for law enforcement or armed security guards. And again, the plaintiffs assert that those are not sufficient exceptions that allow them to engage in their religious practice. But the plaintiffs have again admitted that they were not even aware of the exceptions before filing the lawsuit and made no effort to exhaust themselves of the exceptions, whether by hiring external security guards or, or if that's not uh, agreeable to them, by recruiting people from the volunteer is service there, is to there get qualified. Of, is there a change of law in the offing that may moot this or alter the terms of the, of the, of the claim? Possibly, Your Honor, the governor's budget bill did propose an additional exception that would allow places of worship to designate non-security guards to carry weapons to preserve the peace. The budget process is still ongoing, so it is unclear whether the legislature will ultimately adopt that proposal, uh, but it, it is anticipated to be concluded in the next several weeks. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Aaron Murphy on behalf of Pastor Spencer and his Tabernacle Church. Uh, we, we certainly agree with the arguments you've already heard this morning about why this particular provision violates the Second Amendment, but I would like to start by talking about why it does violate the First Amendment and why the district court was entirely correct to reach that conclusion. Uh, in effect, the state has put my clients to a choice, Ms. Pastor Spencer and his congregants. The, the state has said, if you want to carry firearms for self-defense, you cannot enter into his tabernacle church to engage in religious worship. Right then and there, you have an obvious burden on religious exercise. And, and while I, I will certainly happily talk about why this burdens the particular beliefs of Pastor Spencer, who testified that carrying firearms is part of how he carries out his religious duty to protect the flock, ultimately, we don't think that matters. I want to be very clear that when you have a law that specifically regulates how people may engage in worship, that's a burden on free exercise in and of itself, regardless of whether carrying firearms has some particular religious significance. And I think you get that principle from Tandon itself. Tandon, of course, was a case that dealt with an it was a case that dealt with religious worship in the home, how many people could gather in a house to worship. The, the if, if somebody wanted to engage in religious, go to religious services naked, uh, would uh, and the pastor doesn't have a particular problem with that. Uh, the, it would be unconstitutional to enforce um, uh, indecent exposure laws. Of course, it wouldn't be unconstitutional, but it would be a burden on religious exercise. It would just oh, be a constitutional burden on religious exercise, because presumably, unlike here, it would be a burden imposed a, a pursuant to a facially neutral and generally applicable law. Well, but so, so is this. I mean, it, it's. I mean, there's a Second Amendment reason why this is different than uh, you, you're talking about the right of the of an individual person to go to church to, uh, or mosque or whatever uh, in order to engage in religious 
services, and you're saying to say you can't go there with a gun burdens the uh, religious, your ability to go to church the way you want to go to church. And I'm having a little trouble seeing why putting the Second Amendment to one side, which I agree we, we aren't going to do here, uh, and, and you, like the, uh, the previous uh, Mr. Hardaway, have uh, Second Amendment issues as well, and I recognize that. I'm just trying to understand sure. what this, this argument, because I thought the case was about uh, the protection aspect, and you're saying there is a First Amendment right to attend a worship service the way you want, and then there's a burden, but then you say, well, okay, there could be a neutral law. Well, why isn't this a neutral law? That's the sure, so let me take those questions. You know, it's really mm -hmm. two questions. So first, to start with the burden. I really do think Tandon is quite instructive here because what that was was a, a burden on how many people could gather in a home to engage in worship. I don't understand the Supreme Court to have said, well, that's only a burden if you demonstrate that you have a specific religious mandate for three families to worship in a home. All that mattered was what they were doing, they were gathering to do was worship, and California was putting a restriction on it. So I do think just for that question of whether there's a burden on free exercise, if, if you're regulating the act of worship, saying while you worship, you can only be in this place with this many people with these particular items, that's a burden. Now, then you get to the question of, is that a burden that raises constitutional concerns? And this is not a facially neutral law, or let alone a generally applicable one. First, I mean, the provision that we're challenging, subsection C, by its terms applies to only one place houses of worship, places of worship or religious observation. So we can't look at the other? Then look place? at the rest of it, but no. I, I mean, I will say, I, I don't, I, I think that like, essentially when the state has a law that on its face singles out religious places, that it's really then sort of their burden to prove that that notwithstanding that facial discrimination, the law is actually Well, that's what they're doing, applicable. right? I mean, this but, is, this, excuse me, this is not, a law that applies to every place, and in that sense, it's not n entirely uh, generally applicable. But it is applicable to pl if you had a uh, you know a fire code that applied only to certain kinds of buildings, and churches was one of them because of the structural similarities of a church to some other type of building, it wouldn't have to apply to other types of buildings that didn't come under that. What it would have to apply to, to quote Candon, is any comparable secular activity. Mm -hmm. And as Tandon so said- So what's your comparable secular activity is what I'm looking at now. Sure. Again, because they've got a problem with the Second Amendment here that other people are gonna say most of those other things are unconstitutional. But assuming that enough, the but... sensitive locations stand up, what are the, what, what's, sure. can you give me an example of something that looks to them or should look to them like a, a, sure. a, a sensitive location that isn't a church? And let me just start with the legal principle to animate the examples I'll give. So, so what Tandon said is determining, in determining comparability, you have to look at the justification that the state itself offers for mm -hmm. its regulation. And their justification, their principal justification, I understand to be they're worried about places that are crowded and, and may have some limits on the means of egress. Um, you know, and now, it could be a target for could be a target, particular fine, target. Fine, okay. but I think that right then and there, you know, if, you, if, if that's sort of their justification, then you have the problem of, okay, why is it okay to carry firearms in shopping malls, in retail stores, in restaurants that don't serve alcohol, in coffee shops and salons, in office buildings, in all manner of places? And what Tandon says is it is no answer that the, street, the state treats some comparable secular businesses or other activities as poorly or even less favorably than religious exercise. For free exercise purposes, all that matters is that there's anything out there comparable that they treat better. And I just don't see how you could possibly conclude that no, there's no other place in this law that is a place where people gather in crowds uh, and there may sometimes be limited means of egress. So for purposes of that First Amendment analysis, you know, the Supreme Court has been pretty clear at this point that it really is essentially a most favored nation. It nation's doesn't clause. matter that uh, churches and mosques and synagogues are frequent targets of violence. I mean, I, I don't know about malls, but malls do, it does seem, and I, you know, I don't know about any of this really. The legislature has to presumably know more about it than I do. Uh, but at least the things I see on the news are somebody goes into a shopping mall and then shoots somebody in a dispute. 
and everybody runs out of the mall and they close down the mall and all that. Uh, I don't know that mass shootings in malls are the same kind of problem as we've seen with some of the other places that are on their list. Your Honor, the, the, the state has offered three justifications, and the justifications that it said is how they identified sensitive yeah. places None of them was. We picked the places that we consider to be the most Targets. vulnerable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, I, we're not here to dispute. We, we, part of our concern with this law, and I would like to talk briefly about strict scrutiny, is that, that we do worry that houses of worship are targets. But, you know, when you get past the problem that this is not a law that, um, you know, that passes sort of the comparability test that's set out in Tanda, it's facially discriminatory and it doesn't apply to all comparable places. Then you get to strict scrutiny, and boy, I mean, to me, if your concern is that you're worried that places are targets, uh, it, it barely even strikes me as irrational, let alone a nearly tailored response to say, our answer is we're disarming you. I mean, to go back to what was well, discussed. Not only are we disarming you, but we're disarming the proprietor from the ability to select people that he or she trusts Precisely. to provide security. Precisely. We're taking... We're taking what we see as soft targets and making them even softer. I mean, that makes no sense at all. And to go, you know, just to marry up sort of the First Amendment and Second Amendment pieces of this, as you heard earlier, you know, one of the considerations that comes in in thinking about sensitive places from Second Amendment perspective is, well, is the state coming in and at least supplying the security it's taking away? And here, it's, it's not as if the state said, you know, we're, we're going to disarm you, but don't worry. We will make security guards available to you at no cost. Um, we're we're going to take over that burden since we've deprived you of the means of defending yourself. We're just like, leaving you as sitting ducks unless you happen to have the resources to go hire people that we, the state, have decided are approved security guards. So uh, right then and there, I just I think you have a massive problem with mm -hmm. the tailoring. But then you also have traditional tailoring problems here, such as you know this law applies to houses of worship regardless of whether there's crowds. It applies the same way on a weekday when there's 15 people at the massive you know, Horseheads mm -hmm. campus of my client's church, just as it applies when there's 700 people on Sunday. It applies without regard to whether there's children present, how many adults are present, any of that. So it's vastly overbroad, even as to the interests that the state's asserting. And this I, is I assume you're going to answer this by saying you haven't had the opportunity to study the law, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, if the uh, state legislature passes this uh, uh, law that would give uh, churches the ability to decide for themselves, who can be an armed security guard, would that solve your problem? I, I don't think it completely solves the problem because, frankly, what we think the right answer is for churches to be treated like private property owners, setting aside the default debate you've been having earlier, but that the churches should be allowed to just make the decision for themselves whether they want to welcome the carrying of firearms or not, and they shouldn't have to combine that to people that they choose to designate security guards. Now, to the extent what the state is really proposing in this new law is you know, you can designate security guards, and, and you can do that by posting a sign at the church that says, literally anyone who enters our premises is now considered a security guard. I mean, I find that just a, a really bizarre notion, and I don't know why at that point you wouldn't just put churches under the provision of the law that allows private property owners to make their own decision, because otherwise you've just got a law in the books that's super confusing and chills both Second and First Amendment rights by leaving people uncertain as to whether, you know, Am I someone who just goes to church carrying my firearm? Am I, am I now suddenly a security guard just because my pastor told me I am? Okay. I see I'm out of time, so unless anyone has any further questions. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, three points again on rebuttal. The first is that the plaintiffs have, at this argument, tried to transform their free exercise claim into something that it is not in the complaint. The plaintiffs have asserted that this is a claim that is brought on behalf of the congregants. That is not a theory they ever advanced in their complaint or advanced below. And in fact, Pastor Spencer, again, this is at page 200 of the, of the record, said that he does not know which of his congregants carry. This is not an issue that he's ever discussed with his congregation. It's not an issue that he's ever discussed with his supervising bishop about the congregation. This is really an attempt to transform this free exercise challenge about a particular person's stated religious practice. 
into a claim about the religious practice of many other people who are not plaintiffs in this case. And we know that from the relief that counsel just asked for. The, the relief is not that the plaster gets to designate particular people to be security guards and carry for that purpose, which is the relief that was requested below and was discussed extensively at the PI hearing. The relief is for anybody to be able to enter the place of worship with firearms at any time subject to the place of worship barring them from doing so. That's just a fundamental transformation of what this case was argued as below. Uh, second, um, the plaintiffs suggest that anything that one does at a place of worship is necessarily a part of religious activity or practice. So any time that the state regulates something that occurs within a place of worship, they are infringing on religious activity. That's just not. Uh, I'm puzzled about one thing uh, that Ms. Murphy talked about. Uh, uh, <laughs> My instinct, uh, in a certain way, is to say, well, the church is sort of like theaters and uh, libraries and museums and other places uh, of, of cultural uh, significance. There are places of quiet contemplation and so on. Uh, and so uh, this is treating like places alike. But it is true, isn't it, that in uh, the pandemic cases, uh, the, the court told us that we can compare to grocery stores. Uh, yes, Your Honor, but the reason the court told us that is because it looked to what was being regulated when it occurred in the place of worship. Yeah, but if you're talking about, as, as she said, if you're talking about places with uh, large numbers of people in them, uh, interior spaces with um, uh, uh, limited in egress and ingress, uh, that that starts to look like a lot of these commercial establishments. Now, I'm a little surprised to hear pastors saying, we're just like a nail salon. Uh, but uh, in, in the relevant sense, what's the difference exactly? Where, where other kinds of businesses, and again, that may not be the way we ordinarily think of religious institutions, that other kinds of businesses, the proprietor can say, you can come in with a gun. This kind of business, not and it's got the special extra rights of being a religious institution. Why doesn't that mean that they're being discriminated against? A couple of answers to that, Your Honor. One additional reason for why places of worship are designated as sensitive is that they are sites of constitutionally protected activity. So in that sense, they do share a feature with other places like uh, polling sites or courthouses that are dissimilar from private commercial establishments. Um, Second, in those pandemic-related cases, what was being, what the court said was being regulated was gathering for worship services. It is not true that those cases stand for the proposition that anything that occurs in a place of worship is necessarily a regulate, a regulating something that occurs in a place of worship is necessarily a regulation of religious activity. That simply cannot be the case. In those pandemic era cases, the Supreme Court actually specifically focused on statements made by the then governor that that, that characterized this restriction as being a restriction about worship services, which we don't have here. And the last point that I'd just like to make is that the legislature is entitled to make determinations of sensitivity based on empirical evidence or data. It is not correct that the state has never defended this regulation because of the specific threats that are posed to places of worship. We've made those arguments below and on appeal. This law does not make places of worship softer targets. What this law says is that the risk of firearms in these places is so substantial that we are directing the use of firearms to security guards and other trained professionals that can use these weapons responsibly. That is, for purposes of the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, a determination the legislature is entitled to make. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll take that matter under advisement. Uh, the next case, Ivan Antonyuk, Corey Johnson et al., B. Stephen Negrelli, and uh, Joseph Cecil. Thank you. For the last time today, may it please the court, Esther Murdukaeva for the state defendants. Under the terms of the district court's injunction, the state would have to grant firearms licenses to persons whether or not they were able to use a weapon safely. 
And those persons would in turn be able to carry their firearms into places like Lincoln Center, the Central Park Zoo, downtown restaurants, or even private homes, all without notifying, much less obtaining consent from property owners. Bruin does not envision, much less mandate this result. The injunction should be reversed for several reasons. I'll begin with the licensing provisions, which we actually have not spoken about yet. Uh, the plaintiffs lack standing to challenge a licensing provisions. Five of the six plaintiffs already have licenses, so these provisions have no effect on them. And the sixth plaintiff, Mr. Sloan, has never applied for a license. Under well, he's never applied for a license, but he says uh, he objects to and uh, he wants to challenge the information gathering or information requirements of the licensing law, right? Do you disagree that he lacks standing to challenge those uh, informational provisions? I do disagree for several reasons, Your Honor. The first is that in Libertarian Party of, of, uh, of Erie County, the situation was the same. The plaintiff there was challenging the notion of licensing. The argument there was that a government could not condition the Second Amendment right on licensing. And the court there concluded that not applying for a license was still enough to mean that that plaintiff lacked standing, even though the plaintiff was objecting to kind of the concept of licensing. Well, he's altogether. not objecting to the concept of licensing. He's objecting to the specific, some of the specific requirements of New York's licensing law. And the, the barrier to entry, as it were, is that he says you shouldn't uh, be constitutionally permitted to ask me certain questions. Uh, now, putting aside the merits of that, isn't that something that he has, he wants to apply for a license, I take it, uh, so long as he doesn't have to go through some of those procedures. Uh, so why can't he challenge those procedures? So, and just to be clear, he challenges both those procedures and the substantive good moral character Yeah, but isn't it, it well, the next question is gonna be, uh, if he has standing to challenge those uh, informational provisions, isn't the only reason that you have for having those is the good moral character provision? I mean, isn't that what they're in support of? That is what those uh, disclosure requirements are in support of, but it does not mean that having standing to challenge those disclosure requirements would mean that you have standing to challenge the good moral character requirement. Well, I'm just puzzled then, because if he has standing to challenge the, uh, you wanna know what his social media accounts are. Uh, uh, I, I guess he has some. Uh, I'd be in a fortunate position of not having to deal with that. Uh, but uh, if, if he, he says, you can't ask me that, that's an intrusion on my privacy or whatever, yada, yada, or that's a violation of the Second Amendment itself because it's a deterrent to my, whatever his merits arguments are. Uh, but your response is going to be, I take it, that the reason we ask these things and the reason we're entitled to ask these things is because that's part of enforcing the good moral character requirement. And you're saying, okay, so he can challenge those provisions and then he loses because we just have to say we have a good moral character requirement. He can't come back and say, but you're not allowed to have that either. Well, he, I guess just to be clear, the reason for Article Three standing is to ensure that courts are not adjudicating hypothetical disputes. We have no way of knowing whether his application would be rejected because he lacked good moral character. In fact, if you take his allegations- Wouldn't it be rejected if he came in and said, I refuse to answer those questions? Oh, but that rejection would be on the basis of submitting an incomplete application, not on the basis of failing to meet the good moral character requirement, which has substantive elements. We have no way of knowing how a licensing officer would interpret those substantive elements to apply to his application because he never submitted okay. one. That is the exact same situation that was at issue in Libertarian Party. That's the exact same situation that was at issue in DeCastro. But even if there was standing to challenge these requirements, they, uh, the challenge would all fail, all of the challenges would fail at the textual part of the, of the test. These provisions are all intended to ensure that only law-abiding and responsible people obtain firearms licenses. Those are the people that are protected by the text of the Second Amendment. Conversely, people who fall outside uh, the category of law-abiding and responsible people do not have Second Amendment rights. Here, these requirements are tied to the assessment of being law-abiding and responsible. The good moral character requirement ensures that a person 
be entrusted, be entrusted, safely entrusted to use a weapon uh, only in a can manner. I just ask you, the law abiding aspect, I mean, to me suggests concerns about criminal background, criminal behavior, that type of thing. Social media postings, um, how is that a appropriate uh, circumstance to look at to determine law abiding? And I guess perhaps you would say it goes to good moral character, but that's, you know. I have no idea what the licensing official would be looking for beyond a post perhaps related to criminal activity. Well, the definition of good moral character in the statute references having the character, temperament, and judgment necessary to be entrusted with a weapon and to use it only in a manner that does not endanger oneself or others. And the review of social media is intended to confirm that the applicant is able to be entrusted with a weapon and to not use it to hurt himself. So, or if there others. was suicidal ideation expressed in uh, uh, posts on social media, and I take it, I mean, I'm a little unclear about this, and maybe you can help me with it as a preliminary question. Uh, he's just supposed to give his accounts, right? Tell a list of the accounts. Identify the accounts. I assume yes. that means that somebody's going to look at those accounts, but I also assume that at least on the first bounce, uh, at least until we get to what I suspect would have to be the basis of some kind of as applied challenge, some request for further information. If you look at what is publicly available to any Facebook user or any Twitter user uh, on the account listed in this name that he has given us as the name of the account, that in the first instance, the only thing you're going to be able to look at is what is available to any users, right? Correct, Your Honor. That is a fundamental misunderstanding yeah. of the law and the plaintiff's argument. The law does not require that you friend a licensing official so that they can see otherwise right. restricted information. And, and the licensing official has some discretion to ask for more, but it's a little hard for me to see how that could be the basis of a facial challenge until we know something about what has been asked of a particular person or of what the record is generally about what they ask about people, and we haven't gotten to that kind of thing yet. But let me just, so let me just get back to that. Is something like suicidal ideation the kind of thing that you would be looking for? Because I'm just trying to figure out, you, you have this standard, uh, and then you've got this whole list of things that are interesting, uh, examples of things that, categories of people who might not meet the good character requirement, right, who are not allowed to have licenses. And I'm trying to look for who else is there uh, who is not safe to have a weapon, who has not fallen into any of those categories, and that was the first thing that occurred to me. Uh, is, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? It could be, Your Honor, and in part because there is documented evidence that people who use firearms to sure. commit suicide often also use it to hurt others. All the time, this, including the, the, police officers. The, the state is also separately has an interest in preventing suicide, but that is a harm. Yeah. The, the harm posed by the use of firearm to oneself is a legitimate state interest that warrants the application of this requirement. But I think Your, Your Honor's questions more generally go to the, the problem of bringing this as a facial challenge. Because as the district court acknowledged, there are innumerable constitutional applications of the good moral character requirement. This court actually identified many of them in, in Libertarian Party. Uh, there are also innumerable constitutional applications of the various disclosure requirements. There may be as applied challenges that come in the future, but the hypothetical possibility of as applied challenges is not a basis to enjoin these provisions um, on their face. Uh, I see that I'm over time. I would like to briefly address sensitive places as there are more at issue here, if that's there's all right. A lot of, there's a lot of them that, and I don't know which ones they're going to emphasize uh, in their oral arguments, but there are a whole bunch of them you've got to deal with. There, there are many of them, Your Honor, and I guess here, again, I, I would emphasize that there are, uh, I guess, two alternative paths to looking at sensitive place restrictions. One would be to find historical twins. That's not required, but there are cases where you will find those historical twins, like the places of worship, or like public parks, or like places for uh, kind of social, educational, well, It's interesting that you go gatherings. to public parks first, because one of the things that I found most odd about this, Public parks includes Adirondack Park? It does not, Your Honor. Oh, why not? Uh, is there a definition of parks that I've missed? 
Well, the, Depart the New York State Department of Criminal Justice Services has put out guidance on the scope of the okay. law and has specified in that guidance that Adirondacks and Catskill State Parks are not public parks themselves. They may have buildings that are separately sensitive locations. Okay. But the, well, what the about what about Allegheny uh, Park and Harriman State Park? Between the two of them, that's about 100,000 acres. Are they included? Uh, I'm not sure of the answer to that, Your Honor. I will also note that this is also the subject of some legislative proposals that are being discussed as part of the budget process. Because some of these places, some things that look to me like public parks, and I didn't see any definition that excludes uh, any of the places that I mentioned, uh, uh, those are places that have maybe not lions and tigers, but certainly bears. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, I've seen deliverance. I feel much safer in the streets of Manhattan than in some of these places because that's where I come from and I'm used to it. Uh, so uh, it, it seems to me that going out in the wilderness uh, uh, armed uh, is some attraction to that. If I ever went in the wilderness, I might reconsider my not having weapons. So what really you're talking about all those vast expanses of areas are, are gun-free zones because they're sensitive places? Your Honor, there may be room for an as-applied challenge to the designation or inclusion of a particular park as sensitive. But what the plaintiffs are seeking here is an injunction against enforcement of this provision in every public park, including places like Prospect Park or Central Park well, why, that why, are- Why couldn't we conclude that the, that the, um, that the intended and reasonable scope is uh, city parks, parks in urban areas. Well, there's nothing in the statute that would infer that as a matter of legislative intent. I, I suppose if what Your Honor is asking is whether you could interpret well, the- question the is whether the legislative intent includes places that the legislature may properly restrict guns in and places that they can't. So you could decide this as, as a question of legislative intent. I'm not aware of anything in, uh, kind of on the face of the law that would allow for that conclusion. But there is the guidance from DCJS, which well, I guess if, the court could use to inform if there's its historical, conclusion. If there's historical support at appropriate times for, um, for the regulation of, of, uh, uh, of the Second Amendment in urban parks, but not elsewhere, then, then part of the of the statute could be constitutional, theoretically, and part unconstitutional. So, if Your Honor is asking if you could interpret the historical record to be limited to city parks, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, that that is one conclusion that you could reach. I don't think that the statute are exclusive. The, the historical statutes are exclusively limited to city parks, but many of them do arise in the context of city parks because that is where public parks arose in, as an institution in the 19th century. And part of the district court's error was in categorically just rejecting all of those prohibitions because they came from cities. And as I mentioned a few hours ago at this point, uh, the regulation of firearms by cities was some of the most central and uh, kind of pervasive reg firearms regulation in the nation's history. Uh, separately, the court misapplied principles of analogical reasoning and principles of, of relevant similarity in many different ways here. One that we have not yet spoken about is the court's imposition of a population-related metric uh, in discount, uh, announcing at the preliminary injunction stage that it would discount certain laws from certain states or jurisdictions that it deemed were, were too small. There are many problems with that conclusion. The first is that there is no basis to find that laws have less of a place in the historical tradition of this country because they come from small states. Small states have equal sovereignty to other states and their laws should be considered as well. Second, there is nothing in Bruin that allows for this kind of population-driven conclusion. What the court cited to and the plaintiffs cite to is Bruin's discussion of the territorial laws. But the territorial laws were discounted in Bruin as analogs for the proper cause requirement. And the conclusion there was, in light of the overwhelming evidence that the Supreme Court identified on the other side supporting a tradition of public carry, laws from territories could not be enough to surmount uh, the, the tradition on the other side. The the court did not hold that territorial laws as a matter, as, as just a whole, holistic matter, could be excluded, nor did the court hold that because the territories were small, all laws from all other jurisdictions that are also small could be excluded. Again, 
What Bruin was aiming at was ascertaining a standard that would capture an accurate understanding of the historical understanding of the Second Amendment. You cannot reach an accurate understanding of the historical, understand, uh, of the historical meaning of the Second Amendment by applying these categorical <coughs> rules that just carve out relevant historical evidence. And that is exactly what the district court did here. Whatever rule your honors announce uh, today as to how you apply Bruin's test should focus on the purpose of the Bruin test, which is to reach an accurate understanding of the meaning of the Second Amendment, not to apply categorical rules, kind of gotcha requirements that artificially circumscribe the historical record. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. Good morning, Your Honors, and uh, may it please the court. Uh, my name is Todd Long for appellant uh, Joseph Cecil, who is the chief of police of the Syracuse Police Department. And uh, my argument here today is very narrow. It is not focused specifically on the law itself, but whether Corey Johnson, uh, the appellee and plaintiff in the case, had standing um, with respect to the preliminary injunction that was brought against Chief Cecil and the fellow appellants. Uh, I just want to highlight just a few what we believe are factual errors that resulted in abuse of discretion uh, that were made by the district court that resulted in founding of standing against um, Chief Cecil vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Johnson. Um, the court found um, two, particularly two types of locations in which uh, there was standing. Uh, one, a variety of retail locations throughout Onondaga County, uh, including uh, by name, gas stations and big box stores, uh, but not identifying any specific stores uh, that Mr. Johnson would be going to uh, with his concealed carry. Um, I would emphasize, though, just when speaking about Chief Cecil, is that his jurisdiction is with respect to the city of Syracuse. Um, and I don't know how familiar people are with the geography, um, but the city of Syracuse is one of, as, as I put in our papers, 19 municipalities within the county of Onondaga, centrally located within the county. Um, and so that's important with respect to the notion of those various locations. Uh, the other factual issues with respect to those locations relate to the zoo, uh, which is a county park uh, known as the Rosemont Gifford Zoo. Um, so as the court is well aware, uh, it would be Mr. Johnson's burden uh, by clear showing uh, to demonstrate that there would be some injury effect that was concrete and particularized and that was actual or imminent. Um, with respect to any fears of arrest or prosecution by Chief Cecil, uh, they can't be imaginary or speculative or even uncertain. Um, as to that first error with respect to, particularly to um, the general location of stores, the court drew a conclusion <coughs> or inferred that um, Mr. Johnson uh, lived within the jurisdictional boundaries of the city of Syracuse. Uh, nowhere in his declaration or in the complaint does uh, Mr. Johnson indicate that he lives within the jurisdictional boundaries of the city of Syracuse itself. Uh, instead, an inference was made that um, Mr. Johnson could or does live in the city of Syracuse on the grounds that he quoted um, a press release or a press statement that was in our local paper um, regarding um, the county district attorney and our chief of police, uh, Chief Cecil, uh, and indicates that um, um, the district attorney, William Fitzpatrick, and uh, Chief Cecil are the top law enforcement officials where I live. Um, we believe it is a step too far to then infer that he is an actual resident of the city of Syracuse. And why that's important is well, because- Wait, wait, wait. Sure. Why, why are we not reading that, uh, drawing reasonable inferences in favor of the plaintiff? He says, these are the guys who enforce the law where I live. Why, why would he say that if he lived outside of Syracuse or, for that matter, with respect to the district attorney, outside the county? Uh, don't we assume that he means, when he says they're the people who enforce the law where I live, that he lives where they enforce the law? Isn't that what he's saying? Well, Your Honor, uh, with respect to that, two, two issues. Uh, number one, it would also be a fair inference when I'm speaking of uh, top law enforcement authority in the area where I live, and I'm referring generally to the county. I could also refer to the county sheriff. I could be referring to a lot of things that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily indicate that it's, I live within the jurisdictional boundaries of these generally top law enforcement officials within the county. Um, the other issue is that um, with respect to, uh, I'm getting lost, um, my second point, my second point is there was every opportunity, 
after mm -hmm. we oppose the in preliminary injunction to provide some sort of evidence or a declaration that he was indeed, in fact, a resident of the city of Syracuse. That was not offered. There was an indication in briefing, which is not itself factual mm -hmm. evidence, that that's where he lived within the city of Syracuse, but there's nothing um, before the court as far as factual evidence. And, and are we also to assume that if somebody uh, uh, says, you know, I go shopping in lots of places and here's how this is going to affect me, uh, I would think that if someone lived in someplace in Nassau County and they said, you know, uh, this is going to affect me when I go shopping, uh, people often cross that border to come shopping in New York City. So if he's suing the NYPD, they're the people who will arrest him enforcing this law, if they're enforcing that law, when uh, he shops in New York City. He has to say, I sometimes go into Syracuse. I, I mean, it, it sort of, it seems very artificial what you're asking here. It seems to be a silly proposition. Um, but what I, the reason why I bring this up is that the court used this in order to bolster what I believe a wholly speculative argument to begin with, that Mr. Johnson was go to, going to go to a specific place where he would concealed carry. Again, all he lists is gas stations. Uh, I would venture to guess there are hundreds and hundreds of gas stations within the county. Again, to build this idea that, well, it could potentially be a gas station within the city of Syracuse, that I think it was it was an abuse of discretion for the court to find that, well, Mr. Johnson is a city of Syracuse resident, and therefore it increases the likelihood that he could go to a city of Syracuse gas station as opposed to other municipalities. But does he, uh, the, does he, uh, the, the, the Rosamond Zoo, is that within Sy the city of Syracuse? Is that part of the zoo? He says so as to the zoo, and if you don't mind, yes, the zoo is within the city of Syracuse. If I may just pivot to the zoo, because sure. I think the zoo is a more salient and important point here. Um, the zoo is within the jurisdictional boundaries of the city of Syracuse. Uh, the zoo is actually co-located with a Syracuse city park, and as was just addressed before, the idea of city parks as opposed to maybe larger uh, state parks. Uh, that particular city park, um, yes, is within the city, but also uh, the county zoo is within the city as well. And that zoo is completely under the jurisdiction of Onondaga County. Uh, not only is it solely under the jurisdiction of Onondaga County, but it actually has its own police force. Um, the county parks, and this is not disputed by the county, who is also a party in this matter. Uh, the county of Onondaga has its own park ranger service that provides roving patrols within these particular locations. And so the point of that argument um, that we had made is it creates a, a, a series of further and further causal gaps in speculating as to whether or not a Syracuse police officer would ever be involved in any complaint. Does, this, does, the, does the, the city of Syracuse Police Department have the jurisdiction to act within the county park? They would have jurisdiction, as well, I understand. I, don't, I still don't understand. I mean, I, I, look, in New York City, which I'm more familiar with, I sure. wish I were more familiar with Syracuse, but I'm not. In New York City, we have park police that are a separate police agency. Uh, we have state parks uh, right here in, uh, in Manhattan. Uh, but I also see the NYPD around, and I certainly hope uh, that uh, if some crime were committed against me and I yelled help and there was a city police officer standing outside the boundary of the park, he would come and help. Uh, and I, in fact, I know he would, uh, or she. A, a, a city police officer would do that uh, because they can. It's part of their remit. So again, I don't understand why is it so speculative if this law is going to be enforced that it might not be a Syracuse police officer who enforced it? Well, I guess it creates a more level of uncertainty. And the standard here and the burden on uh, the plaintiff in seeking a preliminary injunction uh, on these Article Three matters, particularly with respect to standing, is one that is just shy, if not at, summary judgment. And so if he would have to make some sort of showing factually that there is no dispute that under these circumstances, it is likely, uh, if not certain, that I would be arrested making certain actions, say concealed carry at the zoo. Um, if he cannot meet that burden, that burden is on him. Um, I would note the John Doe's case, the um, county of Suffolk, uh, again, where there's a specific articulized uh, threats, so to speak, of prosecution relating to the violation of this particular law re, uh, dealing with this firearm. None of those conditions would exist here. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Raise it. 
Uh, I still think it's the morning, so good morning, because I don't have a watch on, but good morning, and may it please the court. My name is Steven Stambalia, uh, my co-counsel Rob Olson, and we represent the appellees. Um, so there's a couple of things that I would just like to um, kind of start off with. This law, the Concealed Carry Improvement Act, was enacted eight days after the Bruin decision came out. Governor Hochul promised that she was going to fight back, and the New York Assembly and her did just that. They thumbed their nose at the Supreme Court, they retaliated against the Second Amendment, and they're really thumbing the no their nose at ju ju the judiciary in general. How can it be that New Yorkers had more rights prior to Bruin, more Second Amendment rights, than they do after it? It doesn't make any sense. Now, I want to kind of address some of the uh, concerns that uh, my, my friend Mr. Long had about um, uh, Plaintiff Johnson. Um, we have the, you know, to, to all the other places that he says wasn't particularized, he didn't name the gas station, he didn't name the specific big box store he, need, he wanted to go to within Syracuse. Um, we have an admission that he has, uh, that he wanted to go to the zoo. Now, um, Mr. Long's client wants um, Plaintiff Johnson to list exactly when and where and how, how long he's going to be there, and the Supreme Court doesn't require that for standing. Uh, his client made a statement that he was going to um, on a complaint-driven basis, uh, take and seize firearms from people that were, you know, prior to the Concealed Carry Act, lawfully carrying within uh, numerous places. So I, I think that's enough, and the district court certainly found that that was enough, and it was not a, an abuse of discretion at this early stage for the district court to find that. Maybe something later on happens, but at this point, I don't, I don't think it was an abuse of discretion. Um, he also mentioned Onondaga County uh, didn't dispute that they owned uh, part of the zoo or, or the zoo Onondaga County didn't even oppose the preliminary injunction. In fact, like five out of five of the defendants filed non-opposition motions, uh, not opposing the preliminary injunction for for various reasons, known only to them. Um, and I think that that's worth pointing out to the court. It was just you know a select group of people that were really adamant about this. And despite Chief Cecile. Or, or Chief Cecil, I should say. I'm not from here. I don't speak that way. Um, not not having like having lots of opportunities to say we're not going to enforce it. We're not going to enforce it. What does he do? He files a reply brief, an opening brief, and a reply brief where he talks about how important this law is. Okay. Well, I can tell you who it's not. It, it's not. It, it might be directed at keeping bad people from carrying guns, but what it's doing is it's keeping everyone from carrying guns all over across the state. Even though they were permitted, they jumped through all the hoops that New York had. And it's stopping everyone from carrying a gun. No one, no one wants bad people to carry guns. No one wants murderers to carry guns. I'm certainly not going to walk into your house, judge, with a gun uh, without you specifically inviting me to do it. No Thank one's you. saying that that, that, should be, <laughs> that that should be allowed. And you probably wouldn't. But no one's saying that that should be allowed. But you have the right to, if you had your own medical practice, to tell who could, who could come into your house or your medical practice and who not to. The state took that away from everyone that owns their own business if it's listed as a sensitive place. I'll give you an example. Pastor Mann, plaintiff Mann in this case, um, is the pastor of a church and lives in a house connected, a, a parsonage connected to his church. The state on the auspice of, of exercising his uh, bundle of rights, right? They took one of his bundle of rights and said, we're not gonna let you carry in, in this parsonage, in your home. In the district court, um, counsel for the defendant said, well, that's an interesting question, whether or not Pastor Mann could have a gun in his home because we're gonna to have to wait for an enforcement action. And, and the reason is that the parsonage is physically connected to the church, is it a place of worship, he has some kinds of Sunday school meetings and whatnot in his, in his, uh, in his parsonage. The state couldn't answer that. To me, that's a really easy answer. Of course he can carry in his home, of course he can possess it in his home. But the state said, we're gonna to have to wait for enforcement. Well, I think that's wrong because sometimes the, he, maybe he fi is found not guilty, but kind of the, the punishment is the process. He's still going to have to go through all of that, and I don't think that's the right way to do it. He, he stated his intent to carry in his church no matter what. Um, it, it's, it's funny, um, when the court first granted the temporary stay, and they basically said, we're going to enjoin, I'm sorry, we're going to stay all of the district court's opinion. And when we had a chance to reply to that, and we said, whoa, you're giving them more than they even asked for. And they, they came out and said, well, we're only going to um, appeal churches, but we're going to let people designate who can carry in there. And we're going to uh, appeal the buses, but not private buses. Um, so the relief that was provided is not even is, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase that, I'm sorry. You know, 
the, the court went um, kind of a little bit too far. Well, but and you're then, here now on yeah. the merits. On the merits, So, yes, uh, you know, I, I take it that what we think are the merits of the case mm -hmm. will determine what is going to be allowed to be enforced and what isn't going to be allowed to be enforced. So uh, a, a previous panel dealt with the stay. We're here with a stay in place. It might get lifted depending on how this case comes out. Uh, they, they, you know, the decisions below could be affirmed. They could be reversed. Let's let's focus on the merits of the the case, and, 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 and I was, that'll get us going. I was going somewhere with that okay. judge, and I kind of lost myself for a second. Um, I think it was you, judge, that asked about some some legislation that's coming up uh, that might moot out one of the cases. It I think might it, moot out his. It might not moot out yours. Uh, let, let's, uh, you know, uh, uh, you've got. I'm sure you get a little more time, but you've got limited time, and you've got a whole bunch of places okay. that we want to talk about as sensitive places. You've got this licensing uh, requirement of good moral character to talk about. Let's not get too lost in the, okay. the, the, the weeds of procedure. Okay, well, I'll address um, my friend's over here argument about uh, the, the analogs in this case. I think Bruin is pretty clear that we have to look back to 1791 and not necessarily to 1868. Um, Can I just ask you, just as a sort of a big picture question, uh, and I asked an, another advocate earlier about this, what is your view of the significance of the designation of a place as sensitive, and also Bruin's uh, suggestion that there can, in fact, be new sensitive places? What, how are we to interpret that? Well, Bruin did, did presumptively uh, announce some amounts of sensitive places, right? And then they said there could be new, which was italicized, and analogous sensitive places. So I don't know that something that's in, been in existence since like the 1800s could all of a sudden be some new and analogous place. I think the place would actually have to be like an, a new place, like an airport, something like that, rather than something that we reach back into history with after someone's upset that the Supreme Court ruled on something and then just Well, how many of these things that they're talking about existed in 1791, uh, at least in anything like the way they are now, uh, museums, public libraries, public schools? Uh, none of this was around at the time, right? But we, we've Were there even zoos? We, I, I'm, I think the, the earliest zoo was in the early 1800s, Judge, but yeah. we've always had schools. The school might look different than, than it looks like now, but the, to, to say that, well, it's a sensitive place simply because it's new. Well, the Supreme it, Court said that was a good example. So, I mean, they, they're not giving us a whole lot to work with here. Uh, you know, there's all this picking and choosing of historical evidence. This is too early, this is too late, too small, too big. Uh, whatever it is that slices and dices the historical evidence. But at the end of the day, the only examples the court gives us are things that are very hard to square with the kind of application. I mean, you, you know, the, the state says uh, what Bruin was looking for was the historical record with respect to public carry, uh, which Certainly there were people carrying weapons in public in 1791, and that looks like a pretty good place to start. Uh, but now when you're talking about something that the court says has historical weight, which is that guns can be regulated in sensitive locations, and then it tells us that, well, you're looking for analogs. They don't tell us how, what, on what bases things are analogous. They give us some examples that don't seem to fit that slicing and dicing of the historical record. Uh, they tell us that if there's been dramatic technological or sociological change, and then they say the island of Manhattan, which I must say I'm sure looks a lot different uh, to any, would look extraordinary to someone from 1791, unlike, say, the Adirondack Park. I don't think we've got a lot to work with. So we're trying to ask you to tell us how we go about deciding, even if we take the narrowest view, how would we look at the question, what is analogous to courthouses, uh, uh, polling places, the state capital, that somehow also probably encompasses schools and government buildings of all descriptions, which may, may also encompass public schools, I don't know. So how are we, gonna, how are we supposed to do that? You tell us, well, how do you think we should do it? Well, we could look at what Judge Sinatra did in uh, one of the other cases that was argued earlier, where he says that you know it's key functions of democracy. Uh, we could look at um, other other not schools, but something like a school that you know on a condition of entry into the building, your your metal detector or or uh, otherwise you have a security guard, a door. The only guard. reason you have a metal detector is to keep out guns. 
I mean, you know, uh, I'm just, I'm just puzzled. I mean, it's you know, not, because you put up a medical detector, you can then keep guns out of there. Well, I'm, I'm answering the court's oh, okay, question sorry, about yeah. like what, what other type of, of building could be considered a sensitive place. And I'm not saying that just the fact that there's a metal detector there mm -hmm. makes it sensitive. Uh, but if, if, if the court's looking for something that could be comparable, you know, we would go back to the, uh, the Bruin how and why, and we would look at is, is the how and the why a comparable burden to um, now as it was understood back in 1791. And I want to, if I could, and I know I'm over time, so thank you. Um, I think the Supreme Court has made it really explicitly clear. We have Espinoza v. Department of, uh, Montana Department of Revenue, and Ramos versus Louisiana that points back to 1791. And Bruin itself points to 1791. And while it did leave the question kind of open, like can we use 1868 at all, it says we can use 1868 law and further law to, inf to confirm that our understanding of what people understood in 1791 was accurate. And if I could, um, real quick, it's, you know, uh, let me see. The Supreme Court said in Espinoza that they were using more than 30 states that created a statute in the late 19th century cannot by itself create an early American tradition. In that case, it was um, um, a school, uh, that people were paying money to go uh, from the state to go to uh, religious schools, Christian schools. And the state said, well, you can't do that. You can't use this money. And they said, well, in, in the late 19th century, we had all of these states. We had over 30 states that also thought the same thing. And the Supreme Court said, 30 states isn't enough. So when my friends from the states say, we have three ordinances, we have two territories, or we have you know three states, three states isn't enough. Bruin sets the floor. It has to be well-established, and it has to be representative. As, 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 um, and it has to be from you know, the time period when the Second Amendment was ratified. Anything comes after that can only confirm what the understanding was during 1791. I'm not sure I understand that. I mean, 1791 is a point in time, and uh, the founders uh, 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 were mainly young people, and they had full careers afterward, and, and their children were like first generation after the founders. I'm not sure I, 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 I see a problem with with, uh, with considering what the law was, what, uh, what the understandings were as they were expressed, even 40 or 50 years after 1791, with the understanding that, um, that, um, that uh, uh, th those laws and those arrangements would have still reflected the understandings of the people who, who lived at the time that the amendment was ratified. And, and Bruin discusses, um, um, you know, the various historical analysis, sometimes pulling census data, which they actually did both in the, in the majority and in the dissent, uh, to look at populations to see if, this, if those statutes were well established and representative of, of the population as a whole during that time frame. Now, I'm not saying you can't go three or five years behind, three or five years uh, in, in front of 1791. But what I think Bruin says specifically is that it's not that, that Bruin doesn't endorse some freewheeling um, usage of any historical time period. You know, we're looking at- I don't know what freewheeling means. I mean, I'm a lawyer and you look to <coughs> precedents and you look to laws and I guess that's freewheeling. I, all I can say is what, what the court says, Judge, and uh, just, Justice Barrett also cited it in her concurrence as well. So. Yeah, but she was talking, she was specifically suggesting that we should be looking principally at 1868, right? Uh, uh, and then she goes along with the, the majority opinion and says, well, but I'm on misunderstanding. I don't believe that her concurrence in Bruin was um, saying that we should rely on 1868. In fact, it looks to be opposite than that because she, she cited to Espinoza um, in her concurrence, which is the, the case that I read talking about 30, 30 statutes coming from um, the late 19th century isn't enough to create an early historical tradition. So um, I could have- But before, but you can't go too far back either though, right? I mean, I mean it, 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 just, it just puzzles me. The whole thing puzzles me. Uh, uh, this is not the same thing, it seems to me, as interpreting a statute and saying, well, uh, the Congress or the legislature had before it judicial decisions that said this, that, and the other thing. So we look at what was before them at the time, and we can say, well, they must have intend they must have known about that, and they must have intended to incorporate it. 
but then if you're saying, well, we're not, not going to do that. We're not going to assume that they had this great understanding of all these English precedents. So it's not exactly like that. Uh, but I, I guess I have the same question as Judge Jacobs. Ultimately, why isn't the subsequent uh, uh, history relevant to what everybody thought the Second Amendment meant? Uh, you know, we have to find something where at the time in 1791, if, if, if there wasn't legislation on the books somewhere that prohibited something, then we assume that everyone thought there was a constitutional right to do that something? Well, I mean, Judge, we have put together, uh, you know, the, the defendants in this case have put together a, a massive historical record and submitted it to the court. And the court, you know, I know that this court has questions on it, but the district court weighed and measured all of these different cases, appears to be faithfully following Bruin, depending on um, the, the timeliness of the statute, the population that was at issue. Um, and that's why we go back to, like, we, it's not an abuse of discretion to issue a preliminary injunction at this point. And, and granted, not all of the, the questions have been answered, but just because all the questions haven't been answered doesn't mean that the district court abused his discretion in, in coming up with the, the answer that he did. I mean, he didn't give us everything we asked for, and he didn't give the state everything they asked for. So it wasn't like it's just completely one-sided judge mm -hmm. um, and I and I know the court wanted to talk about good moral character I'm, it's, it's all right. briefed if you had any questions I'd be happy to answer them right well just actually one question I would ask yes, on the, the licensing issue as far as standing your view is that it wasn't necessary um, well it, what is necessary to have standing to, to challenge the the licensing. The licensing. So, um, you know, uh, this court has the DeCastro precedent, which holds that um, there's a, a futility exception for actually having to go and apply the uh, for the permit itself. Um, and if we take the case, um, it's a United States Supreme Court case, um, Simmons v. United States, where the Supreme Court has found it, quote, intolerable. Uh, that one constitutional right should have to be surrendered in order to assert another. And that's what Mr. Sloan has done here. He's not going to give out his, his private uh, social media accounts to the government. That's a violation of his First Amendment right. It's a violation to, to remain a, uh, a violation of his First Amendment right. Why to is his social media accounts private? I'm sorry, sir? Why are his social media accounts private? I thought they're social. They're, they're all out there. I, why can't the government just go in? and look for them, he, all he's doing is providing the convenience of giving a list. Well, to the extent that they're public and the government already knows about them, then fine, but a lot of people post anonymously. I'm on Twitter, not under my real name, but I don't want the government knowing who I am. Uh, it's, it's none of their business, Judge. You know, so maybe I wanna troll them or something. Like, I just keep it, keep it to myself. It shouldn't disqualify me from owning a gun. Uh, I'm a, you know, Mr. Sloan's a law-abiding citizen, but he doesn't need to sit down. Well, but what's the, what's the value of any kind of background check? Uh, in effect, uh, I, I take it you're not, at least you're not challenging uh, any of the various categories of people who are categorically excluded as dangerous under the statute. Maybe other people will have problems with that, but you don't have a problem with that. Uh, uh, but then, so you check the box that says I've never been confined in a mental institution and they just have to accept that? They can't do anything to look into whether that is true or not? Well, now, may, I, I don't know about the social, the social media accounts are gonna help that, uh, but having to provide names of people who are close to you, a rather limited number of names, who might be able to be interviewed and say, yeah, he was locked up in a mental institution for five years. Why, why isn't that something that, I mean, are you saying they can't do anything? They can't follow up? The state has the ability, Your Honor, with all of those examples that you just gave, to be able to go into some of their databases and pull whatever information they want. Even in Mississippi, where my permit comes from, they run a, a background check, a, a NICS check from the federal government. Yeah. It doesn't take three years, Judge. Well, but there's a longer list of these, uh, uh, of these categories, though. It's not just things that would be in that database. Now, again, I, I understand there's a little bit of a, a complexity here that we're not looking at all of these provisions, and some of them may be unconstitutional in themselves, I suppose, if someone were here who had standing and wanted to challenge them. Uh, but for our purposes, we're assuming that a lot of these other categories, they're in the law. Uh, why, why, doesn't there, why isn't there some further ability to check into that? Now, again, there may be specific things that are too much or uh, uh, wouldn't be sufficiently helpful. I get all the arguments about right. that. 
but in terms of the basic question, can the government inquire about anything other than you tell us, are you one of these people, and you say no? Uh, why, why can't they investigate some more? Well, the government is investigating, Your Honor. I mean, this isn't something where I go and apply and they just take my word for it and give me the permit that mm -hmm. day. This is a one-year process just to apply. Mr. Sloan it hasn't even been able to apply yet. And then a one- Well, he hasn't applied yet because he objects to some of the requirements. So I don't know that you can say how long it's taken him because well, he's declining to participate. Well, I, I can say how long it's taking him, Judge, because his sheriff does not have an appointment available, or at least at the time that we filed this case until October of 2023. So when we, when we filed this case, it was over a year for him to even apply, knowing that an incomplete application would be denied because the sheriff had admitted it. But isn't that more relevant to perhaps an as-applied challenge? Like the delay that you're talking about isn't something that is <coughs> baked into the statute. Well, the statute says six months, Your Honor, but if uh, in practice this is a, a New York thing because the statute obviously allows for that to happen. Like no, no permits get issued within well, six wouldn't, months. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that if the, if the government has to dig through databases and do independent research in order to find out that which um, an applicant can put on the application form, that will only make it longer. Uh, they may make for longer waits before these, uh, these uh, permits can be granted. If, I'm, I'm sorry, Judge, if they... You're, if you're saying it takes too long for these applications to be acted upon. And on the other hand, you say, why should, uh, why should applicants provide all this information when the government can spend its additional time digging through databases in order to find out what it wants to know and what the, app, the particular applicants say they don't want to provide. Well, my, my answer to your question earlier, Judge, was based on people that, that have publicly facing social media. A lot of people, I mean, I shouldn't say a lot because I don't really know. Some people, in, in this case, Mr. Sloan has a account that's private that's just set to his friends. Um, he has a right to post anonymously. There's, there's a lot of uh, jurisprudence on anonymous well, speech. He, he, he doesn't have to friend the government. The government doesn't have to, can't get well, into that. that that's, it, it is true that that's what they said in their briefs, Your Honor, but the statute completely that says that a social media review shall be done. It's in the statute. It's not just that, oh, okay, here's the list. Okay, somebody's got to go review that. I'm, you know, Nassau County certainly thinks that they have the right to request passwords. There's a, the provision in the license in the code that says the licensing officer can ask you any such information. Well, how hard would it be for the licensing officer? To, Let me just see your phone. And what are you going to do at that point? Maybe you've got some crimes committed that you've done and you don't want to disclose and, and invoke your Fifth Amendment. You think the licensing officer is going to give you a, a permit at that time? I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I appreciate it. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, hello, Your Honors. Uh, I have four points, two just small ones about the scope of the injunction and two bigger ones about sensitive places. About the scope of the injunction, um, my colleague said that no one wants dangerous people to have guns, but that is exactly the relief that the plaintiffs have asked for and the district court ordered by precluding the government from using its good moral character requirement, which is designed to weed out dangerousness, and precluding the state from asking for information that would inform that inquiry. Next, my colleague said, Judge Lynch, no one wants to enter your house with a gun without asking you. Again, that is exactly the relief that the plaintiffs asked for and the district court ordered by enjoining the private property provision with respect to private residences. With respect to sensitive places, just a, a couple of big picture points. Uh, Judge Lynch, you asked, what are we to make of the use of new and analogous or, the, or Bruin's kind of discussion mm -hmm. of modern developments? And we think there are two things that this court can look to. New and analogous can mean that a place, even if it existed at the time of the founding, can become sensitive over time. The Supreme Court made clear that there are going to be cases that implicate unprecedented societal concerns, dramatic technological changes, and noted that the regulatory challenges posed by firearms today are going to be different from the historical time. This can come up in two, at least two different ways. One, uh, firearms are obviously very different. The harms that can be imposed by today's firearms are very different, and that can be considered in deciding whether, uh, kind of what principle of analog analogical reasoning you look to. 
The other point is that the way people go about their daily lives is fundamentally different today than it was in 1790. The population of New York City in 1790 was 33,000 people. An average attendance at a Yankees game in 2022 is 40,000 people. We're just talking about fundamentally different worlds that we live in. And what the court in Bruin made clear is that the Second Amendment does take some regulatory options off the table, but it does not tie the hands of legislatures or courts to res in responding to these modern developments uh, by enacting reasonable laws that are relevantly similar to laws that existed earlier. And the last big picture point I'd like to make is about the use of evidence after 1791. This is especially important in the, seven, in the sensitive place context. As I mentioned earlier, the sources that Bruin itself cited in support of the sensitive places it recognized reference 19th century laws. If you look to schools, there actually are not founding era sensitive place regulations about schools. If that was the rule that your honors would adopt, it would, it, it would render that portion of Bruin meaningless because Bruin will have recognized sensitive places that could actually not survive the test that plaintiffs say Bruin established. Uh, for all of those reasons, we urge that the court reverse the injunction. Can I just Thank ask you. one one question that uh, uh, came up in the argument that I, I really hadn't <clears throat> thought much about? Uh, before uh, uh, Bruin, New York relied on a uh, the, the the special needs uh, licensing to deal with all of these problems. Uh, uh, almost all of the plaintiffs uh, in uh, these cases already have carry permits under New York law. Uh, so before Bruin, they could have gone into any of these places, at least absent some affirmative, uh, you know, I mean, I, I assume that Lincoln Center, or at least the theater I go to most, wouldn't let me in with a gun because they do have metal detectors, so I guess that's what they would do. Uh, but subject to what they would do, Someone like most of these plaintiffs could go to the zoo carrying a gun, and, and now they can't. Uh, why, why, it, why does that not say something about how strong the justifications are for treating these places as so sensitive that even people who passed, now I realize these people may just be grandfathered in a way, and now there are going to be a whole bunch of people who, thanks to Bruin, will be able to get uh, 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 carry permits for the asking. Uh, but is that is that the difference that this, now all these other folks get to to run around with guns that makes these sensitive locations more sensitive than they were the day before Bruin? Well, Your Honor, as a legal answer to the question, the fact that certain places were not sensitive before does not mean that the Second Amendment precludes legislatures from designating no. them as sensitive now. Right? That that presumption is kind of referencing what I discussed earlier. It. You can't presume that governments are always regulating at the maximum of right. their constitutional right. authority. So the mere fact that certain places were not sensitive before they is weren't really regulated. legally irrelevant. The fact that they weren't regulated before under the somewhat different conditions where we had our 100-year-old Sullivan Law uh, that the Supreme Court discovered was unconstitutional, uh, uh, that, that doesn't mean that if they weren't regulated then, they couldn't be regulated now, because they've always been, or at least have been, in recent history, sensitive places. It's just the state didn't feel the need to deal with it. Is that the answer? That, that's exactly right, Your okay. Honor. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you both, or all three. Uh, next case, uh, we'll take that case under advisement. And our next and uh, final case is uh, Nadine Gazola, Seth Gazola et al. The Kathleen Hickel at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you could just hang on a second. <laughs> We had the most interesting case. <laughs> <laughs> All right, whenever you're ready. Thank you. 
My name is Paloma Capana. I represent the plaintiff appellants in Gazzola versus Hochul. Nadine and Seth Gazzola are here today in the courtroom with us. Thank you for the opportunity. What a morning. I think the two words I would like as my theme for oral arguments are concrete and stable. Myself, I am so pleased that we are here on federal firearms compliance issues, which do have such a stable and logical progression since the 1968 Gun Control Act. So hopefully we will not be suffering from quite as many hypotheticals, if you will, Judge Lynch. My problem is that we have been in a state of crisis since December 5th, and I seem not to be getting across to the court the urgency of the circumstances in which my clients and any other FFL 01 or 02 finds themselves here in the state of New York. So I make myself a list of dates. First, we had to deal with the crisis of the annual certification. We were talking earlier about communists and could a sign be put up about communists? And of course, my anchor cases for that were what? Back to the communist era and the certification. Are you a member of the Communist Party or not? In this case, have you complied with all of New York's new mandates or not? Then we moved on to the monthly inventory reconciliation report, which no one even knows what to do with. Then the semi-annual book of acquisition Why, why do you not know how to do an inventory reconciliation? You have, uh, you have a certain number of guns that you had. No, some no. got sold, some new ones got bought. You add them up, you count the ones you've got, and you see whether it, what it is. No, but the statute does not say what to do with it. Are we supposed to hold it until the New York State Police arrive? Are we supposed to be mailing it in? Well, if it doesn't say you're supposed to mail it in, then I guess you don't have to mail it in. But what if the officer shows up with a different interpretation? We have well, not I only know, that, we what, have I mean, Generally speaking, like income tax returns, I have to file. There's a law that says I have to file them every year. Yes. There are other record keeping requirements on many businesses. Uh, uh, that say you have to keep certain records, so yes. you keep them. It doesn't say you have to mail them in, so you don't have any place to mail them to. I'm not sure I understand what is the ambiguity there. Look to the next one that is due, the first semi-annual acquisition and disposition book photocopies that are to be mailed in in April. So it's my next crisis with the plaintiffs. We find ourselves once again at a point where we are going to have to be invoking our Fifth Amendment rights. Well, I'm not sure, again, I, I, I'm not entirely, I mean, I understand there will be people who are violating certain rules, and that may create uh, a Fifth Amendment problem. But I thought the principal argument that was made below and was made here was that no one can say honestly that they're in compliance with federal and state laws because there are conflicts between federal and state laws. I thought that was the argument. We are Am I missing something there? Yeah, we are in compliance with the federal laws, absolutely. We are in compliance with New York state laws that predate the new laws that went into effect on December 5th. Where we are not in compliance is with the Group A laws, several where we intentionally are saying there is a conflict. Yeah, but there isn't really. Resolved. I mean, in other words, that's the issue that is before us, is whether there really is an inconsistency. Yes. And as to the general state of crisis, I mean, this was a preliminary injunction hearing, right? There was a hearing. There was no hearing there was in no our hearing. case. We simply had oral arguments. There was no testimony taken mm -hmm. at all. But, there, is, but there, are, there are affidavits and so on, yes, right? So there are factual correct. conclusions that the uh, district court drew. The district court dismissed us on a text order in less than 24 hours of the oral arguments, and then some days later, after we had already submitted our first emergency motion to this court, turned in a written findings. So when we did the emergency motion, okay, we well, said that was the emergency was motion. Now required. we're here. Now we're talking about the merits. Now we have a set of findings by the district court, mm -hmm. and so the question, as I understood the issue here, the basic issue here, and, t and tell me if I'm just totally misconceiving this. You argue, mm -hmm. and this part I think has to be more or less right, I can't speak for anybody else on the panel, uh, that if there were burdens that were placed on gun dealers that made it difficult, uh, enormously difficult, put a substantial burden on people's ability to acquire firearms, that would violate the Second Amendment. That makes a lot of sense to me anyway. Uh, but then we have a district court that said no such thing. There's no showing that these folks are going to go out of business, and there's no showing that even if these particular plaintiffs did go out of business, that it would still be any, you know, 
Nobody's entitled to have a gun shop on every corner so to make it very convenient for them to buy guns. Uh, so, you know, you have to show, if you're going to rely on that argument, that what the regulation of gun dealers, which the Supreme Court has consistently said is something that's okay, in general, generally speaking, uh, is uh, being conducted in such a way that it's going to make it very hard for people who want to buy guns to get them. And I thought the district court said that showing hasn't been made. So is, is that really I'm not the issue, whether the district court clearly erred in finding that uh, there is not that level of burden? And she clearly erred because she really jumbled the issues. What I've tried to get across in our papers is that the laws we complain of fall into three separate categories, group A, B, and C, and a separate standard will apply to each. So when we're looking at a direct conflict to federal firearms compliance law, such as there shall not be a gun registry, dealers who create certain records at their business premises must maintain them there full stop, we're looking specifically at preemption question. Well, tell me exactly, give me your best shot as to here's what the federal law says and what the state law says is inconsistent with that. Sure. Congress, three times over, has stated a very clear intention that there shall never be, at any point, a gun owner's registry. The state of New York has admitted that that is what they want to do with the records they wish to take from my clients. When we go through federal firearms compliance law... Uh, tell me exactly what, where it says that in the law. What is the, what is the law that says they are creating a gun registry? There are numerous sites, Your Honor, and I laid them out consecutively. Just give me one. Just give me one if you know. I want, I want to be able to look at them. Tell me what is the best one that says they are creating a gun registry, a registry of gun owners. The state of New York admission to that point is contained in the papers that are currently pending before the United States Supreme Court. I did put that uh, note in both my brief and in my reply. I can... Pull that separately okay. if you'd like. Okay, well, no, Mr. if we got it, if we got it in the yes, in the materials. Yes, it is there. Yeah. The the statute. Aren't they? Don't don't they sort of have that? I mean, this is what's sort of peculiar. If they're giving licenses to everybody, then they have a list of all the people they've given a license to. But a handgun license list housed by the New York State Police is not a gun owner's registry. Oh. A gun owner's registry is every firearm bought and sold. A permit, for example, does not even require a person to own a handgun. I see. Yes. yes. And so when we go from Congress to the United States Attorney General, to the ATF and the FBI, then to the FFL, they function essentially as agents for the federal government in the transaction. They are collecting specific information from the consumer of firearms. They are the only person with the connection of the person to the specific arm. But how does that make you mm -hmm. subject to conflicting obligations? That may be something that New York State shouldn't do. New York and State maybe shouldn't a, do and it. And maybe a gun owner can complain about that. Why is it a problem for you? Because my clients are the dealers who would be subject to federal felonies for disclosing their records to the New York State Police. There's something that says their, your records cannot be shown to the New York Police? That they may not be given to other than their premises, through the point even that the business itself closes, at which point, and I've laid this out in my papers, there is a specific ATF on site that happens for those records to go into permanent hold with the ATF, then under their own strict regulations where it may not ever, in any circumstances, become a gun owner's registry. That is correct. In order for it to become a gun owner's registry, mm -hmm. you would have to send it into the state, correct? That is correct. But you so, said earlier that there's no law that requires you to do that. There is now. Oh, there is now, yes. That thought, is why I we're here. Said, yeah, I thought you said that the gun dealers Mm -hmm. are in a pickle because they don't know whether they have to send it in or not. And whichever uh, they do, they may find themselves um, in violation of the law. Judge Jacobs, thank you for that clarification yeah. question. You will find that there are several provisions of the statute at New York General Business Law, Section 875. We have at least eight different new record-keeping requirements. 
Some, such as the one for April, that I'm most concerned we might get a ruling on soon, would require us to photocopy and mail them to the New York State Police. We know that. We do not intend to do that. We will be invoking Fifth Amendment rights again to do that. What I referenced, however, was the monthly inventory reconciliation, Can which you that one give me specifically the, the, says. Uh, the cite to the federal statute that says you would be um, violating federal law if you do exactly what you described? I do. Well, Mr. Beasley is speaking. If you wish, I can look that up in my papers. What Thank I've you. done That'd in the helpful. papers is I do have it as Group A, and I walk you through each one of the record-keeping requirements, and I specifically reference not only the 18 USC provisions, but also the 27 CFR and also 28 CFR provisions that could be charged against my clients in the event that they violate federal law, absolutely, or we would not be here. We would not be here. So in a, it, in a sense, it boils down to, in a choice between going to fate, federal prison, if you will, or state prison, our choice is that we are going to follow the federal law first. We consider that to be the apex. We consider that Congress has been very clear in three statutes, and now, most recently, the bipartisan bill from June of 2022 under President Biden, again, the reaffirmation there should not be a gun owner's registry. So that speaks to our Group A laws. As to our Group B laws, then we have a couple provisions from the CCIA, so we're a little bit back into that question of historic context. There has never before, either in New York or in the United States, been a license required for a long gun. Now there is one. And when the state, my learned colleague, Mr. Kiernan, provided some statutes that were historic, those four laws actually prove our point, that men who were uh, showing up for their militia duty brought the rifles they owned and possessed. They brought the ammunition that they owned and possessed. There was no license that was required either for the long gun or for the ammunition which rolls us rather nicely into my slightly esoteric point that I'm hoping, Judge Jacobs, you might in particular uh, muse around with, the notion that there is still one word left in our precious Bill of Rights to interpret, and that is the word to keep. It says to keep and bear arms, and yet to bear really has had pole position. I mean, look, even this morning, everybody left, right? Here I am to talk about to keep, which I think is the most interesting historic minute we could have in our generation. Well, let me, let me just uh, try to understand the argument. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is it your position that there's some special license required of a gun dealer to keep the very guns that he or she is selling? Is that the point? Or is this a separate argument that some of your clients would have whether they were in the business of selling guns or not. Mm. We believe that to keep, of to keep and bear arms, has an independent value that has yet to be realized. So I cited to you in my reply papers a decision from 1871 where Andrews versus State looked like two judges from Tennessee, maybe kinda, came close to seeing that the words to keep have an independent value. And one memorandum from 2004 from the Department of Justice to President Bush, where they gave two pages on the words. I'm sorry, I, had very, I thought it was a simple question. Are, we, are you saying that this issue about keeping arms, which after all I thought was what Heller was about in the first place, so that's why we're getting to bear, because now we have the carry issues which are different. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just ask, are your, are your clients saying they're, they're objecting to something they want to do as private citizens that any of these other folks could have also challenged if they chose mm -hmm. uh, and if they had an interest in it? Or are you saying there's something that the keep obligation is special for gun dealers? Which is it? I mean, and, and I, I'm just ignorant. I want to know what, the, what you're arguing. The argument is it is one and the same, that arms is the only object in the Bill of Rights. In order to bear arms, you are owning and possessing them. You are doing that by going to the dealer. The dealer is inextricably linked. 
if New York is to prevail, and as I say, let's just go to my worst case scenario, gun dealers start shutting down all across the state of New York. It will not matter what you have already talked about this morning. There will be no firearm to bear. The New York citizen, as a practical matter, even if they have a concealed carry permit, will have nowhere to go to purchase that firearm. Okay, but that gets back to what I was prepared to concede at the beginning. And again, I don't, I don't, maybe I won't be after I finally study it and after I talk to my colleagues and they, if they have a different view. But my inclination is to say, yeah, okay, that's an, that's an argument. But factually, mm -hmm. the district court said you haven't made the showing that that is what is likely. So that... Uh, so that's the, the, the issue. So what you're saying is, so now, now what you're saying you about better. the right to keep is not about either. Mm -hmm. My client wants to buy a long gun and now he needs a license and that's unconstitutional. And that's just something he wants separate from his being a gun dealer. Nor is it that somehow the licensing requirements prevents him from having inventory. But we're just back to... If the gun dealers have to close down, then everybody's Second Amendment rights are violated. That's the, that's the basic crux of what your argument is. Yes, I am not here with a property argument or a seizure of property argument. I, I got am it. here okay. the way that we rolled it across. Was okay, to so then say, let's get back to yes. what is it that makes the district court's finding clearly erroneous when the district court says that you have not established that all of you guys, let alone, all of the people who are, that you represent yes. are going out of business, let alone that all the gun dealers around New York are all going out of business. Why is, why did you, how did you make that showing? Yes. What's the evidence? By a new standard, constitutional regulatory overburden. So as I've laid out in our papers, and most particularly in the reply that we just submitted, if we recognize to keep as the new kid on the block, the final word to be interpreted, and we give it a separate independent value, then this court would need to have some way to know when is that being violated. We are proposing constitutional regulatory overburden, that there comes a point where the state is targeting clearly an industry. New York General Business Law, Section 875, only applies to dealers of firearms where the burdens heaped upon them are impossible for the whole list of reasons that I set out, technologically infeasible, financially implausible. Look at the totals that we've done on our specific statute section by statute section analysis. You can't do it. It is designed to drive an industry out of business. And so when you come back to a comment such as, well, what if we just have Walmarts? Well, Walmart only has 47 FFL licenses total in the state, and as of 2019, their public policy is they don't sell handguns. That brings us down to runnings, also proposed by the state of New York. 10 FFL licenses total for the state of New York. Where does that leave us? You were talking earlier, what are historic analogs? How do we know when a case is close enough? I have said, perhaps to the point of boring in, in these different proceedings, you're in steel workers versus US. You're in those wartime necessary industry cases where we have a pocket of 14 cases total that have essentially gone to sleep because they haven't been of use. Now they're of use again. Because right here, right now, what you have is a state who is getting tricky. We've got this wonderful whole women's health case out of the United States Supreme Court, and not only the majority opinion, but the concurring and the dissents nailed it as to what the state of New York is doing. They're not coming in with an outright ban. They know they can't get away with that, even here at the Second Circuit. Instead, they're coming in with a scheme designed to evade judicial review. Justice Comey Barrett nails it with that language. Justice Roberts saying, we may have to work harder as judges because it is not so obvious the end point to which these laws are directed. So we've put on essentially our little see-through glasses to look at this law and say, I come to you today with 31 separate statutes and statutory sections. I am the heavy lift. I was glad when you rearranged us on Friday and I became case number five. I know I'm asking you to do the most, but it is to keep 
And it is my clients with their unique standing beyond the plaintiffs of Heller, McDonald, and Bruin, where you can be first. You can be the judges who are the first to interpret the last word of the Bill of Rights and give meaning to the Second Amendment that will last for generations. Right. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Beasley Kiernan. I'll be arguing for the state defendants in this case. The district court here correctly denied a preliminary injunction, and this court should affirm. As you've heard, plaintiffs principally challenge safety and record-keeping requirements imposed on firearm dealers. Uh, plaintiffs fail to show that these laws are preempted by federal law or even implicate the Second Amendment, let alone violate the Second Amendment. And I'll just note that plaintiffs also challenge three laws in their capacity as individual owners of firearms the training requirement for a concealed carry license, the licensing requirement for the purchase of a semi-automatic rifle, and the background check requirement for buying ammunition. The district court correctly held that plaintiffs lack standing to challenge these laws, and they're consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation in any event, because they're designed to ensure that those possessing arms are in fact law-abiding, responsible citizens. Uh, but turning first to the safety and, and record-keeping requirements, Insofar as plaintiffs are attempting to assert a Second Amendment right to sell guns, the district court correctly held that there is no such right. This is consistent with the Ninth Circuit's decision in Teixeira, uh, which held that there is no independent freestanding right to sell firearms under the Second Amendment. And the Ninth Circuit in that case did an exhaustive analysis of both the text and the history of the Second Amendment. Insofar as plaintiffs are attempting to assert a Second Amendment claim on behalf of their customers, uh, as the district court explained, plaintiffs have just failed to show that these challenged laws prevent plaintiffs' customers from purchasing arms in the state of New York. Uh, as you've heard, plaintiffs' theory is that the laws are so burdensome that gun stores across the state will close. There's no support for this in the record. Even in plaintiffs' reply brief, they acknowledge that there are still over 1,700 gun stores in the state of New York as of February 2023. Nor is there any evidence that any particular New Yorker is unable to purchase guns because of these safety and record-keeping requirements. Do you agree that if they could make that factual showing, they would be able to, they would have standing to raise uh, that issue? In other I, words, why isn't this just like when there was a, a constitutional right to abortion, uh, that uh, uh, abortion clinics would come in and say, these various regulations are designed to make it impossible for us to do business? And those were, some, some of them won, some of them lost, but they were all considered on the merits all the way up to the Supreme Court. So, I mean, are, are you contesting that they shouldn't even be here? Or are you saying basically that they just haven't made that showing and so we don't have to worry about that? That's right, they haven't made that showing. Whether New York enacted such a restrictive law that really did prevent New Yorkers from purchasing guns, whether in that case these particular firearm dealers would have standing to challenge those laws, that's a difficult question. The Ninth Circuit said yes, in that kind of situation, firearm dealers would have derivative standards. Well, that was certainly the case when you had one left abortion clinic in a state and yes. there were regulations that were not particularly relevant to safety that seemed to be aimed at closing them down, then that made out a claim. You're saying that's not where we are here. Right, that's not where, where we are here, exactly, Your Honor. And the district court ruled this way on the merits after reviewing the evidence and the record and finding that it just didn't support plaintiff's claim. Mm -hmm. Uh, turning to plaintiffs' individual claims, the district court correctly held that plaintiffs lack standing. First, plaintiffs are not injured by the training requirement. That applies only to those who are seeking a concealed carry license. Plaintiffs already have a concealed carry license. Under penal law section 400.00, those licenses, quote, shall be in force and effect until revoked. Plaintiffs need only recertify their licenses every three years, and that does not entail any training requirement. Plaintiffs have also failed to show any injury in fact traceable to the uh, semi-automatic rifle licensing requirement, which applies only to the purchase or transfer of possession of a semi-automatic rifle. Only one plaintiff, Martello, states that he even desires to purchase a semi-automatic rifle. Uh, he, has, he does not describe any concrete plan to do so, certainly hasn't applied for a license, uh, so he has not shown any actual or, or imminent injury 
Even if there were some potential injury, it would not be traceable to the state defendants. Martello's claim is that his county is not issuing semi-automatic rifle licenses at this time. There's no evidence for that in, in the record, and we're not aware of any uh, widespread refusal to issue licenses at the county level. But even if it were true, it would just mean that Martello's hypothetical injury would be traceable to the county, not to the state. Uh, for similar reasons, plaintiffs uh, have failed to show any injury in fact traceable to the ammunition <coughs> background check requirement. They haven't shown that they will face any obstacles in purchasing ammunition once those background check requirements come into effect later this year. On the merits, all these laws are consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. And your <coughs> honors need look no further than footnote nine of Bruin, which states that nothing in this court's analysis should be interpreted to suggest the unconstitutionality of shall issue licensing regimes, such as the licensing regime for the purchase of semi-automatic rifles. Bruin goes on to specifically cite background checks in firearm safety courses as examples of components of a lawful shall issue licensing regime. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence makes the same point. He states, shall issue licensing regimes are constitutionally permissible, and they may require a licensed applicant to undergo a background check and training in firearms handling. And the reason these laws are constitutional is twofold. First, they do not necessarily prevent any responsible law-abiding citizen from keeping and bearing arms. Indeed, plaintiffs have not shown any infringement of their own Second Amendment rights here. That's why they lack standing. It also means they fail to show that these laws implicate their Second Amendment rights. And the second reason is that these laws are consistent with laws, uh, a longstanding tradition of laws designed to ensure that only law-abiding responsible citizens uh, possess arms in this country, uh, preventing dangerous people from, from bearing arms, essentially. And I don't think uh, any court has disputed that uh, a state can take certain reasonable prophylactic measures to ensure that dangerous people do not possess and bear arms. Uh, unless there are any further questions, uh, I'll rest on my briefs. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So what might actually assist the court, if you turn in that, the appendix, I mean, you'll find the one-page chart that brings our case down to the A, B, and C, so that you can see how these laws both operate and then the theory of law behind them that we are arguing. What is in the record, also right at the same point, is the six-page chart. So when my learned colleague talks about these safety rules and regulations, and you and I, Judge Lynch, get into a discussion of what is vague, is part of what we've been dealing with is that the law directed the agencies to promulgate rules and regulations, to promulgate the curriculum for the <coughs> statewide firearms training, to issue different kinds of documents, of which they haven't. They have not. So when my colleague stands up here and says, well, nobody's having a problem getting guns, that is not true because my clients in their declarations and with full standing can say as a dealer, it is illegal for me to sell a semi-automatic rifle to a customer who does not have a standalone semi-automatic rifle permit. You go to the chart and you see why is that? Because the New York State Police have failed to issue what the format is for this permit. So no county clerk in any county is capable of issuing the semi-automatic rifle permit. <clears throat> My clients then pivot to the customer side of the counter and say, we can't buy one. And the state cannot force my clients to become ignorant, to walk into a colleague's dealership, for example, and say, gee, Judge Lee, would you mind selling me a semi-automatic rifle? and pretend like they don't know that the law is it would be a felony for Judge Lee to sell us a semi-automatic rifle without that freestanding license. This is what we mean about the scheme that New York State is perpetuating here. There is not a single person in the state of New York who can get the training required as of September 1st for a permit because the state police has failed to issue the standardized curriculum. 
and my colleague is incorrect as to the law, Section 400 of the penal law does not in any way distinguish between renew and recertify. It is not defined there, and as I set out in my papers, exactly how many times each word is used. The word renew, 39 times. If my colleague's interpretation is correct, then there's nobody who can actually renew their permit. They have to go on a fresh application every single time, which clearly is not as what is intended here by the law. So we are at a total standstill. And what is happening on the ground is a combination of both ignorance and turning away. Dealers who are actually conducting sales that they know or should know are illegal. Customers who through public education, not undertaken by the New York State Police, but frankly by the proliferation of cases and radio interviews I've been doing and so <coughs> forth, are becoming aware that the county is issuing, for example, an endorsement onto a concealed carry permit, a little stamp that they're adding to your concealed carry permit. They are saying, this is sufficient. Go forward, buy guns. But then the New York State Police website recently is saying, that's not correct. Plaintiffs in Gazola versus Hopo, they do not use those words. I only wish they did. But that our theory is correct. You need a freestanding license. So what is happening on the ground right now in New York is a total collision. The black letter of the law versus the papers of my colleague versus the New York State Police website. It is not a situation that we have experienced in New York. It is not a question of was the Sullivan Act taking care of it? No. What was taking care of it was this Bible, the white book what I live by every day doing federal firearms compliance law, which states with clarity what is to be done, on what date, with who. We understand how the Second Amendment has worked without judges, without courts, without precedent until this governor last summer passed these laws directed at my clients only, only the dealers, Aren't Nobody those else, that, that white book is also aimed only at the dealers, right? Uh, anyone who has a federal firearms yeah. license, so also manufacturers, importers, exporters. Yeah. So, so yes. again, the same sort of the same sort of thing here. But it's, it is, so you're saying is, that they haven't issued their white book yet? No, far far from what we have here. Congress, since 1968, has very carefully, and with three major enactments gone through and culled through and organically derived the system that you see today that we use. New York State, in my reply, I walk you through it, took laws Congress has already repealed as being unconstitutional from the original 1968 Gun Control Act and taken that out of the garbage can of Constitution and passed it. And they are claiming these are new laws. They are not. And I cite you chapter and verse through just three of those examples in my reply papers, where two of the original pieces from the Gun Control Act now show up in New York state law. And one ATF regulation that was proposed but not adopted because Congress interceded now becomes part of the new law that we challenge. We are the only statute that has not been adopted by any other state since last summer. The CCIA in sensitive places is a bit like chicken pox, right? We have cases going on in at least seven different states with very similar laws. New York General Business Law Section 875 is alone. There's not even any amicus briefs in this case. That's why I pointed you to and quoted from an interview done where the architect who worked with the governor, per her own admissions at a press conference, says to the Wall Street Journal, whatever's left after they get done in the court. This is not about public safety. This is absolutely a frontal assault on the Second Amendment, cleverly done. But we've dug to the bottom to even interpret for you what were the origins of these unconstitutional laws.
I'm the sweeper, so unless you have more questions, I guess I would say thank you on behalf of all plaintiffs. I've spoken with the other councils, and we do all appreciate this historic opportunity to be with you this morning. All right. Yes, thank you, and thank you, thank you. <coughs> to all the advocates, excuse me, who've argued today. Um, so that's the last case on our calendar. Um, so I believe we are ready to adjourn now. Thank you.